So uh, welcome to the third session of Chromatin Con. Um, today's session is entitled um, Interventions for Healthy Aging and Longevity. I, I think it promises to be a great session with some excellent speakers. And I'm looking forward to some lively discussions. Um, the moderator for today's session is Professor Peter Adams, who is also the co-organizer of the event. So I just want to take um, a second to thank um, Peter um, for putting this together, helping us put it together, and for um, um, making the whole process happen. So thanks, Peter. I, I will pass it on to you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Gary. It's been it's been really wonderful to to help and uh, listen to all the the great speakers. Um, and th thanks everyone for for uh, for, for joining. Um, yeah, I just want to say, as, as Gary says, we have a great lineup this morning on interventions. So everything from um, you know epigenetic clocks to help guide interventions, and then interventions, for example, in the form of exercise to promote uh, healthy aging. So I'm really excited to to listen to all the talks this morning. Um, and at 10:25 uh, uh, Pacific time or 1:25 p.m. Eastern time, we will have a, a round table discussion with with all of the speakers and obviously we, we we love contributions from everybody listening in as well so so please join up um towards the the end of the the, the time for that um so yeah without further ado i'll uh, uh hand over to the next speaker this is uh ognian nechev uh, uh uh paul paul shields was originally scheduled to speak but paul couldn't make it so but Ognion is a, is a colleague of Paul's, so we're going to hear the story directly from Ognion. So I'm really, really excited for this one. Uh, and uh, so Ognion is at the University of, of Glasgow and is going to talk about using epigenetic clocks to track age related physiological function in the kidney. Over to you, Ognion. Uh, Ognion, before you begin, I just want the yes. audience to know that there is a QA uh, uh, button. And mm -hmm. so uh, during your talk and all the other talks, if the audience have questions, you can pose them in the Q&A uh, section. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the introduction and to all the organizers for having me. And thank you, of course, to all the participants for joining, especially those who are joining from not the most convenient time zones. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yes, so I'm, uh, I'm a, a member of the Shields Lab at the University of Glasgow. Uh, and uh, we um, our topic of research is mainly uh, aging and the roles of uh, various socioeconomic factors and uh, biological processes. Um, as we probably all know, uh, biological aging is uh, an increasing problem as a result of the aging of the global population. This is true both in developed as well as in developing countries. The number of old people is increasing uh, everywhere and it's predicted to keep increasing in future decades. Uh, on one hand, this is a good sign because it means that lifespan is increasing and people are living longer. On the other hand, <clears throat> it is not so good because health span or the number of years that people are able to enjoy good health is not uh, increasing by an equal amount so this causes an increasing burden of morbidity and uh, multimorbidity uh, in the population. This has a cost for society because uh, these elderly people uh, who have chronic conditions require uh, health and other forms of uh, care. Uh, and it's also a burden for the individuals because it reduces their quality of life. It limits their ability to enjoy uh, their life and live as they would like to. Um, age. Uh, Biological age comes with a constellation of different diseases that are sometimes referred to as the disease norm of aging. They are all different diseases with different etiologies, but they share common underpinning mechanisms. Some of these are quite well known in the general population, cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases. Some are perhaps somewhat less known, but are still quite important. For example, uh, chronic kidney disease or CKD. Uh, which will be uh, one of the focuses of this talk. Uh, so CKD is uh, a disease that is increasing in prevalence. Uh, it has reached epidemic proportion in many countries uh, and is uh, projected to keep increasing uh, with the aging of the population in future decades. 
the scientific community has identified a number of uh, common hallmarks of aging that are quite well conserved across different taxa, all the way from flies and worms to humans. Uh, the original paper from 2013 from Lopez Otin and other co authors uh, was uh, perhaps one of the most cited papers in this field. It was just updated a few weeks ago with the addition of three novel um, hallmarks that in the recent years have gained increasing uh, attention as in playing an important role uh, in the biology of aging. Uh, these are disabled macrotophagy, uh, microbial dysbiosis, especially in the gut, and chronic inflammation. Among the original hallmarks, I would like to highlight a few that will be particularly relevant for this talk. Uh, telomere attrition, uh, this is the shortening of the ends of linear chromosomes that happens with cell division, as well as uh, as a cause of uh, other factors such as oxidative stress. Uh, another one is epigenetic alteration, in particular DNA methylation, which is uh, very important for uh, expression of uh, and translation and transcription, sorry. Um, it's, uh, it regulates both the transcription of protein coding genes, as well as uh, other non-coding RNAs, including uh, transposons uh, that are all uh, dependent on this uh, genome-wide uh, DNA methylation pattern. Uh, finally, I would like to highlight uh, cellular senescence. This is a permanent exit from the cell cycle uh, that cells undergo typically due to some kind of uh, molecular damage that cannot be uh, repaired. Uh, senescent cells tend to accumulate with age and uh, they are thought to be over the long term detrimental for the local tissue because they uh, can disrupt the local environment. They can precipitate senescence in neighboring cells and uh, they can also uh, cause inflammation by secreting pro-inflammatory factors. In spite of this uh, significant progress, there are still a number of questions that remain at least partially unanswered in aging research. Uh, first of all, it, it, we still don't really quite understand how do we age, what is the exact mechanism sequence of events that leads a young person to become old biologically. Uh, we also don't fully understand the role of the environment, lifestyle, and deprivation into precipitating and accelerating aging. Uh, and also, uh, we have a methodological limitation, which is uh, the absence of a, of a clearly established and universally uh, validated measure of biological age. There's still debate of, about how to define biological age and how to measure it, and which is the best way. Uh, an important uh, concept that, that we think is key in understanding biological aging is antagonistic pleiotropy. Uh, this is the idea that uh, a certain trait or gene can have multiple effects and they can be antagonistic. So some can be positive, others can be detrimental. Uh, this is particularly uh, relevant when the positive effects are expressed early in life and the negative effects are expressed later on because when we have uh, this situation, uh, evolutionary pressure can select this particular trait because it gives early in life an advantage in terms of perhaps survival or reproductive success, even if it comes at the cost of, of greater uh, aging and frailty later in life. Another crucial factor is the role of the exposome. This is a set of all exposures that an organism is subjected to. This includes everything from chemicals to nutrition, micronutrients, uh, as well as uh, socioeconomic factors such as uh, uh, social uh, environment, uh, personal relations, uh, psychological stress, etc. The exposome has a, a very important role. Uh, in fact, there are three exposome factors, air pollution, tobacco smoke, and diet that collectively are responsible for about 50% of global mortality. So we believe that this is a very promising uh, lever for intervention to increase health span, improve uh, health at later age. Um, as I mentioned, our uh, lab is based in Glasgow. And if Scotland is the sick man of Europe, Glasgow is the sick man of Scotland. When we look at mortality rates in different areas, we see that Scotland is at the upper end of the distribution within Europe. 
Uh, but then when we look closer, uh, we see that most council areas are actually comparable to the rest of Europe. However, there are in particular these three outliers that are all deprived areas around Glasgow that have a much higher uh, mortality rate compared to the other regions. Uh, this creates a very stark socioeconomic gradient. Uh, for example, if we compare Colton and Lenzi, which are two council areas around Glasgow that are only 12 kilometers apart from each other, they have almost 30 years difference in male life expectancy. Uh, also, when we look at the map, we can see that affluent and deprived areas are very close to each other, uh, but still they have this uh, very strong difference in outcomes. Um, it is also important to uh, highlight the fact that deprivation is not only a matter of uh, absence of income and money, but it is also um, an absence of other factors such as support, and, uh, other resources and opportunities. So it's not a simple thing to solve with just giving more money to that community. Um, <clears throat> another important uh, aspect that we think uh, is uh, useful for explaining this uh, gap between affluent and deprived areas uh, is uh, the concept of allostasis. This is a pressure that is resulting from either physical or social stress on the body's ability to maintain homeostasis. If allostasis is mild enough and short enough, uh, the organism can recover naturally and reinstate a healthy status. Uh, however, if the stress is too prolonged or too severe, uh, then we need a therapeutic in intervention to return to a healthy state. Otherwise, we have the emergence of disease as a result of allostatic overload and an inability of the body to cope with the excess stress that it is subjected to. Uh, in, th in, the, in the case of Glasgow, we have... Uh, we can see that there are very different lifestyles and exposure factors between affluent and deprived areas. The uh, more deprived uh, population is uh, subjected to a variety of stressors. They are typically uh, have more sedentary lifestyles, imbalanced diets, uh, as well as higher levels of uh, psychosocial stress. Uh, this causes uh, a number of adverse um, sequelae, including accelerated telomere attrition, uh, increased adiposity and uh, poor uh, renal function and hyperphosphatemia. Uh, that is also in particular as a result of excessive uh, consumption of uh, red meat. Uh, as a result of this, the uh, deprived are often a more biologically aged, and this more biologically aged population uh, has, is characterized by higher levels of inflammation, chronic inflammation, uh, and uh, bad health outcomes. Traditional uh, measures of uh, biological aging, such as telomere length, are uh, useful. However, they only explain a small proportion, only about 10% uh, of the variation in inflammation. So this leaves the question of where does the rest, where does the other 90% come from? Uh, and we believe that a big part is uh, played by the exposome. Um, in our lab, we use the kidney as a model for human uh, normative aging, and we use chronic kidney disease as a model for accelerated aging. Uh, this is for a number of reasons. Uh, to begin with, uh, chronic kidney disease and biological aging have a two-way relationship with each other. Each one can precipitate the other. Uh, also, the kidney is a very highly metabolically active uh, organ. It's one of the highest, it has one of the highest metabolic rates of any organ, uh, and it is also exposed to all of the toxins that are produced or absorbed by the body, sometimes in concentrated form. Uh, that, that makes it more susceptible to early damage in case of excessive stress. Uh, in addition to that, uh, that one of the therapies for chronic kidney disease, which is kidney transplantation, is very interesting from our point of view experimentally because it involves transferring a healthy organ into a morbid milieu of the CKD patient. So this allows us to track the progression of biological aging in the healthy tissue and in the control uh, tissue and compare the two. Um, <clears throat> um, in order to uh, measure our outcomes, uh, we're obviously looking for biomarkers of aging. 
and we are following the Baker and Sprott criteria from 19 established in 1988. So we're looking for uh, markers that are functionally uh, related to the process of biological aging, and also that are able to predict uh, physiological and functional capacity at a future date in the absence of a birth disease better than chronological age. Uh, this is actually a fairly tall order because chronological age is in fact a pretty good predictor of future uh, morbidity and mortality risk. Uh, so this has made it difficult to identify, identify good biomarkers of age. Uh, in fact, there are many, many candidates that have been assessed over the years. Uh, but only a few have been validated in uh, humans and none have achieved the status of universally accepted gold standard uh, biomarkers of age so far. <clears throat> in a lab, uh, we have uh, identified as the best uh, predictor of functionality in uh, kidney transplantation, uh, CDKN2A or the protein P16. Uh, this is a cell cycle inhibitor. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be quite familiar with it because it's uh, involved in stopping a uh, cell cycle, uh, establishing and maintaining cellular senescence. It is also one of the primary ways to detect senescent cells and also to target them therapeutically for clearance in uh, cell therapeutic interventions. Uh, so um, in our um, studies, we have uh, seen that CDKN2A is a good indicator of tissue damage of the uh, donor organ. So it is able to predict fairly well whether this organ will function uh, well after transplantation or whether it will fail. Uh, the pre our predictive capacity can be further improved if we add additional uh, biomarkers such as certain microRNAs. Uh, P16 has also been used uh, successfully in a number of other areas, including uh, vascular aging, as well as uh, to target uh, senescent cells for clearance and uh, this, has, this is one of the key pieces of evidence that has shown that uh, senescent cells are causally linked with biological aging. Uh, a more recent uh, biomarker of age that, is, that has gained a lot of attention and that uh, we in our lab have moved to is uh, the use of DNA methylation clock. These are models that estimate biological age uh, or chronological age. Uh, based on DNA methylation levels of specific genomic loci. Uh, we've, uh, we've used uh, three of the more well-established clocks, uh, the Horvat and Hanam. These are perhaps two of the uh, first clocks that gained wide popularity and wide use, uh, as well as the more recent PhenoH, which is uh, an improvement on the previous generation. Uh, the main uh, advance uh, of uh, the second generation clocks is that they are designed uh, to, uh, uh, and they're trained based on not chronological age, like the first generation clocks, but uh, on an estimate of biological age. In the case of PhenoH, this is a composite uh, uh, biomarker of age that is based on blood uh, values. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, the questions that we try to answer with uh, our pilot study that we run was whether CKD patients indeed display increased epigenetic age. And if this is the case, uh, we wanted to evaluate the two common treatments for CKD, dialysis and transplantation, uh, and assess whether uh, these treatments can ameliorate this accelerated aging. Uh, CKD is a progressive disease uh, that goes in stages from one to five, five being the most severe uh, case. Uh, which is also referred to as uh, end-stage renal disease. Uh, and this stage requires ther therapy, otherwise survival is uh, very low. Uh, for this uh, purpose, we recruited uh, patients uh, from a, a number of different groups. Uh, we took samples from uh, CKD stage 5 patients prior to receiving a renal transplantation, uh, as well as patients who are about to start dialysis. Uh, as well as uh, age and sex match population-based controls. We calculated the three clocks uh, as discussed earlier, and we calculated uh, both the epigenetic age as well as the age acceleration, which is the difference between epigenetic and chronological age. 
uh, we uh, observed that uh, the absolute uh, median error, uh, which is an estimate of uh, how closely the chronological and epigenetic age match each other, is uh, relatively low. It is comparable to previous studies, perhaps only slightly higher. Uh, this is reassuring because most uh, clocks are mostly trained on healthy populations, so we couldn't take for granted the fact that they would work accurately in uh, this uh, uh, morbid CKD population. Uh, in fact, we also tried uh, a number of other non-epigenetic clocks, uh, particularly a clock based on skin autofluorescence and one based on blood biomarkers, the phenotypic age clock, which was the basis on which the pheno age clock was trained, in fact. Uh, and both of these non-epigenetic uh, clocks gave us uh, a very high uh, estimate of biological age. Uh, some would argue implausible because uh, they gave us decades, decades uh, higher estimates compared to chronological age, sometimes higher than 100 years of age for patients that were in their 40s, 15s, and 60s. Uh, so this was uh, reassuring and confirmed that methylation clocks seem to uh, give a plausible estimate of biological age. Uh, they have a fairly good correlation with chronological age. Uh, if we look closely, we can see that pheno age has greater dispersion, so the absolute differences tend to be larger between different samples. Uh, and uh, the um, what we observed in our cohort uh, was uh, two uh, interesting pieces of uh, information. Uh, first, we saw that both the uh, pay, uh, both CKD uh, five groups the people about to receive transplant and the people about to go on dialysis, they both showed signs of increased epigenetic age according to all three clocks. So this is uh, this graph shows number for the pheno age, which gave us the largest differences and the clearest distinction and the highest p the lowest p-values. Uh, however, the other two clocks all were also consistent with the same trend. So they all showed increased epigenetic age uh, in um, both CKD5 groups compared to control. And the second interesting uh, finding was that after one year after transplantation, this, uh, the transplant group had partially but not completely reduced epigenetic age. About half of the age acceleration was lost, uh, while we did not observe the same effect in the dialysis group. Uh, this led us to conclude that uh, CKD5 patients indeed show signs of accelerated biological aging, as, at least as measured by epigenetic clocks, uh, and that transplantation partially but not entirely mitigates this age acceleration, unlike dialysis. Uh, this is consistent with other findings, both clinical, that uh, see better outcomes and better survival uh, in transplant patients compared to a dialysis. In fact, transplantation is considered the superior treatment whenever it is available. And it is also consistent with other studies of different markers, such as uh, telomere length and um, other DNA, genomic DNA methylation patterns that show partial but not complete recovery of the healthy state after transplantation. Um, these are, these are some of the uh, current and recent members of the SHIELDS lab, as well as uh, some of our collaborators from around the world. I would like to highlight in particular Paul Shields, which is down here, who's the lead of the lab, Colin Selman from the University of Glasgow also, as well as our collaborators from Karinska Institute, Peter Stenwinkel and his whole team, and Helen Erlandson in particular, uh, who uh, gathered um, all the patients and the samples and collaborated with us on this uh, study. And that is all. I will be happy to uh, answer questions and thank you for the attention. Great, Th thank you very much, Avni. And that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and you know, so I think the, the background of uh, bio, you know, the variations in biological age across Glasgow is, is uh, you know, some something like I think is really fascinating. So it's really interesting to hear that that background as as well. Um, so there's a bunch of questions coming in. Um, I, I'll um, I'll start reading 
mm -hmm. them out. Uh, and if panelists have a question, then you know, please just jump in or or raise your hand. But um, so the, the first question is from uh, Ramin Sadri. Uh, does does loss of methylation using the DNA methylation clocks reconcile and corroborate cellular senescence and or effects on P16 um, slash CDK N2A? So that's so I, I guess in other words, then yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Do they correlate? Uh, so off the top of my ha head, I cannot uh, think of a study that directly compares head to head these two markers in the same uh, uh, patient population. Uh, it must have been done. So probably it's, it's just my mistake for not uh, thinking about it. Uh, just a small uh, note, uh, epigenetic methylation clocks don't necessarily measure only loss of methylation. So depending on the locus, some are positively related, correlated with agents, some are negatively correlated. So um, it's, uh, it depends on the specific locus. Uh, it's not a, while it is true that overall, generally, the general pattern with aging is to see a general loss of DNA methylation. There are some specific loci that actually do the opposite. They increase their methylation levels with age. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, than that. I would imagine that there should be a uh, correlation between methylation clocks and P16, but yeah, off the top of my hand, head, I cannot think of a uh, specific study that directly compares them. Okay. So I think that uh, Marta uh, Kovacheva had a similar question. So, so thanks for the really interesting talk, but again, he's asking about correlations between changes in methylation and p16 levels across the same specific samples so have have you have you compared methylation and p16 in the same samples uh yeah uh not that i recall again unless i'm <laughs> forgetting something very obvious but uh, certainly not in this study and uh, i don't think we've uh... really mm -hmm. sorry that's okay uh but it, it will definitely be an interesting thing to look at. That is a, yeah, that is a very good idea. Okay. So we have a couple of questions on uh, immunosuppressants, one from Kiara Herzog mm -hmm. and another from Ben Parrott. Kiara's asking, uh, is there any indication as to whether immunosuppressant treatment after transplantation might affect uh, epigenetic age? Um, independent of the positive renal effects. I'm not yeah. quite sure I understand yeah. that. And then, and then Ben Parrott uh, wants to know whether immunosuppressants might work through suppressing inflammation as opposed to effects on kidney function. Uh, yeah, uh, so these are uh, both excellent questions. Uh, we have uh, thought about it. Unfortunately, it's difficult to test because to test that, you would need a control group, which means either you need transplant patients who don't receive uh, immunosuppression, which you can't really do because they need immunosuppression, or alternatively, you would need control patients who receive immunosuppression without disease, without transplant. Again, you can't really do that. So it's a bit difficult to uh, assess that. It, it's a very interesting question, but uh, we haven't been able to uh, find a suitable control group that would answer that. Uh, interestingly also, uh, so um, one of the um, possible immunosuppressants that is sometimes used in transplant is rapamycin, which is itself studied as a um, yeah. anti-aging drug. Uh, I checked, and as far as I was told, uh, none of our patients have been put on rapamycin. It's I've been as far. Don't quote me on that. I'm not the expert in this field, but uh, I've uh, been told that my understanding is that uh, a rapamycin is more used in the, in North America and less in Europe. So our patients have been put on one or two different uh, immunosuppressants. Um, whether they have an effect, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an open question, I guess. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think some of these questions might be, uh, it, it might help to know a little bit more about the specific causes of, of the premature biological aging in, in CKD. You mentioned that kind of yeah. in general terms at the beginning. Um, but is, is yes. Uh, so, you be uh, more yeah. yeah, be more specific about what's, what's known about the 
the, mm -hmm. the, the causes of accelerated biological aging in CKD? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. So uh, there, there are a number of factors that um, to a good extent boil down to the problem of uremia. So when the kidneys don't function well, a number of toxic uh, solutes that kid the kidney is supposed to be clearing don't get clear. So instead they accumulate in the blood and that uh, causes different kinds of uh, toxicity. There are a number of uh, molecules that have been identified as uh, playing particularly important role. I'm not sure if we have an exhaustive list of all of the factors that are important. Uh, one really uh, crucial one is uh, the role of phosphate. Uh, uh, CKD patients have increased uh, serum phosphate levels. This causes uh, premature vascular aging through calcification and um, increased uh, inflama inflammation. Uh, and yeah, this has all sorts of uh, deleterious effect because once you have bad cardiovascular health, this sort of precipitates also uh, the health of other organs. Okay. Um, so, in, so, if, so if inflammation is a component, I mean, to what extent then do uh, yes, anti-inflammatory interventions, to what extent do they, do they benefit? Or, or is, or is the, the effect of the fox phosphate, is it, is it toxic, independent of an effect on, through inflammation? Uh, so um, we believe that it is uh, also independent. It has a role independent of inflammation because it is uh, um, it causes uh, calcification. It is essentially it's a um, somewhat complex uh, process, but uh, simplified a little bit. Uh, the excess uh, phosphate it leads to uh, formation of calcium protein particles, so crystals of calcium and phosphate bound by proteins. Uh, these particles are taken up in the vascular especially okay. by uh, smooth muscle cells. Uh, they cause damage to these cells. They cause them to uh, convert their phenotype to a more osteogenic uh, phenotype. And therefore they start depositing calcium phosphate uh, in the matrix of uh, the, the vasculature and therefore uh, cause all sorts of uh, problems uh, to the vasculature. Right. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, we, so we have a couple of questions regarding the age of the, the 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 donor organ okay so to what extent is the effect on on epigenetic age dependent upon the the donor organ so would it would a younger donor organ have a a, a, a more beneficial effect than a than an older donor organ for, for example uh, yes i see so uh we didn't look on at this in this study with uh i'm not sure even if we have the information about the age of the donors um it is possible um oh yeah uh i'm not sure if we have uh, looked at that it could be interesting we certainly didn't have the sample size to also look at that uh in our case i would imagine that given functionality of the organ and also biomarkers of age would be perhaps better predictors than pure age, because you, if you're, you can be very young, but if your kidney is uh, not working very well, if you have low filtration uh, rate, EGFR, uh, then it's not going to be as helpful. You're, you're probably better off uh, an organ that is perhaps slightly older, but has better functionality. However, right. uh, yeah, it is also true that uh, biomarkers of age and damage, uh, for example, P16 does accumulate with age. so there will be a good correlation between biological and age and function of the organ. So uh, I imagine, yes, it, it might play a role. Okay, okay. Um, Margarita Mir has an interesting question um, regarding the difference between transplantation and, and dialysis. So she wants to know whether you think that, I guess the, the lack of benefit from dialysis, is that due to the fact that dialysis is unable to filter out, you know, some of some of the, mm -hmm. the detrimental factors within the within the blood, or is it that dialysis itself is actually a stressful uh, process, which may take away some of the, the benefits? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a very good observation. Uh, and I think uh, both are likely to be true. Because on one hand, yes, uh, dialysis is uh, not as effective as, as transplantation in reestablishing normal values of uh, blood biomarkers. 
At the same time, yes, it is also true that uh, dialysis is a stressful uh, biologically process. So it can contribute. Uh, so I yeah. think in recent years, there have been some advances and improvement in different materials and different tweaks to the methodology of how dialysis is performed to reduce this stress. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is, it is right. a stressful right. procedure. So that right. likely contributes as well. Okay. But independent of that, I mean, do, do you have a hypothesis as to why transplantation is beneficial, whereas dialysis is not? Um, so um, I'm not sure what would be the proportion between these two factors. Our hypothesis is that it is due to the fact that the transplanted kidney does a better job at clearing the toxic solutes and therefore uh, re-establishing, uh, fixing urine, the underlying okay. urine. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's something uh, but, that you could. That's something that you could measure. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps you, you could measure for phosphate definitely. levels for, for phosphate levels, for example, after transplant. Yes. Or uh, so I suppose yeah, we can act, we can look at the biomarkers themselves, regardless of so combine both transplant and dialysis patients. Look only at the mm -hmm. biomarkers and see how that correlates with uh, epigenetic age. Perhaps yeah, that could be an idea. Okay. Um, to look at in the future. Okay. Um, Paul has it. Paul's has his hand up for a while. I think. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. I, I sorry, Ga me. Gary. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. Okay. Um, yeah, Alvin. I do have a question. You mentioned earlier um, socioeconomic differences, and then you mentioned toxins like phosphates. So, have you looked at diet and at the microbiome to? see if there are impacts there that could also be where you could intervene? Uh, uh, yes, definitely. This is uh, one of our other uh, areas of research in uh, recent years uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, we, we think that uh, diet plays a major role uh, in health and in outcomes and the microbiome is increasingly recognized as playing an important role through a variety of mechanisms uh, it seems to be involved in uh, inflammation and modulation of the immune system, uh, integrity of the intestinal barrier and leakage of uh, bacteria and toxins uh, through the gut lining is also uh, an important factor. Uh, also, another crucial uh, aspect is the uh, creation of metabolites. So uh, the gut microbiome has uh, orders of magnitude more genes than the human genome and therefore has a uh, much expanded enzymatic activity and capacity that can create metabolites that our body cannot create by itself. And therefore, these met metabolites can feed and be absorbed into the body and cause uh, either beneficial or detrimental effects. Uh, so yes, this is uh, uh, definitely one of our areas of research. Yeah, we have some recent publication on that line. Uh, I didn't address it uh, myself because I haven't uh, been involved too much into this area, so I wasn't really prepared to discuss it uh, in great detail. Uh, is there a, um, a link with um, how, is there an epigenetic link? Um, Between that, microbiome uh, and epigenetics? Yeah, well, in, in this particular case, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure if we looked directly so it is plausible because one of the uh we believe that one of the potentially important factors is the pr provision of methyl donors from the uh, diet uh, so this would be betting choline uh that can uh, replenish uh, the acetylenyl methionine and therefore um, ensure an adequate supply of methyl donors to maintain DNA methylation uh, I'm not sure if we have looked directly, specifically measured the epigenetic age and microbiome in the same population yet. Okay, thanks. But yeah, that would, that would be also interesting definitely to see. Um, so uh, Prasen Data has a question about um, epic, um, infection induced chronic kidney disease. Um, is there any evidence that the infection-induced CKD causes accelerated uh, aging? 
And I guess that this is kind of generally interesting because there has been, you know, recently there's been some discussion about the extent to which, you know, acute but resolve, resolve, resolvable infections can cause accelerated epigenetic aging and, 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 and then on resolution, does, you know, does the epigenetic age actually go, go back again, which to me seems like, I know that that's what that, that kind of thing is something that makes me think, well, I, I, when we, when we measure epigenetic, when we measure supposed biological age with, with some of these clocks, I mean, are we, are we really measuring biological age or are we just measuring something that, for example, reflects acute inflammation okay if it's really going forwards and, and backwards like that so so what do you know about infection induced ckd uh yeah well uh, this is one of the big open question i guess yeah we, we don't really know uh, what we're measuring with the epigenetic uh, clocks uh, i'm not sure i know much uh, about infection so this is not acute kidney it's still chronic kidney disease but induced by inflammation i'm not sure so personally i don't think i've looked at the different causes of that lead to chronic kidney disease and how, if there is any difference be, uh, between them. So we, usually when we study CKD, we study CKD and we, we don't really look at, uh, at least in the projects that I've been involved with, we don't really look at the causes what has led okay. to this CKD. I imagine to some extent, uh, it shouldn't matter too much because at the end of the day, it's about the functionality of the kidney. So if you have uh glomerular filtration rate of 60 it is 60 it may or may not depend on what brought you to 60. uh of course it's possible that yeah maybe the different causes might cause different type of damage and different type of dysfunction it's certainly plausible that yeah even uh temporary stress can cause permanent damage to the kidney because the kidney is, uh, has a very complex structure uh, that, uh, as I understand, is uh, difficult to regenerate uh, naturally. So typically when you lose uh, units, nephrons, my understanding, so I could be wrong again, I'm not a doctor, but my understanding is that once they lost, they're pretty much lost. There's very okay. little recovery. Okay. okay. Okay, well, there's there's a few more questions in the Q&A that I haven't got to. There's been a lot of questions. So um, hopefully we'll get those questions forwarded to you and you can answer those um, yep, I can try by to answer email. Them. But I, I think uh, I think we need to move on now. Um, yep. So so thanks very much, Ognian, for a really fascinating talk. Thank you. And, uh, uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah. And so the the next speaker is uh, is is Vera Gorbanova from uh, um, University oh, of Rochester. Uh, uh, she's going to talk about epigenetic rejuvenation with 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 Cert Six. Hi, right, thanks for great to have you here, Vera. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Peter, and thank you all the organizers uh, for inviting me. And I've been really enjoying. Um, oh, sorry, I have to start again. Sherry, I, I was really enjoying the talk. So this is this topic is really so interesting to me. Okay, advanced. can see your screen okay but it's in uh yes i'm just trying to mode. get to the presentation mode that looks better all right almost there okay so uh there were uh great talks um uh, the first day and yesterday, uh, talking about aging uh, as you know being the product of um, so-called epigenetic or epigenomic drift. Uh, so that is how uh, you know I imagine epigenomic drift to look like. So something very sad um, that is happening, you know, drifting away, um, and um, perhaps um, you know that results from a combination of factors. 
so if this is the young cell with the chromatin being nicely organized uh, into compact uh, heterochromatic domains, more open domains, uh, epigenetic landscape is very sharp and defined, uh, but over time uh, when um, the cell goes through DNA replication, uh, transcription, and of course DNA repair, um, things really get messed up. Even the cell is trying very hard to put everything together uh, the way it was, uh, but it's not perfect. So over time, uh, the noise accumulates and the epigenetic landscape uh, becomes smoothened. Uh, this is also my favorite analogy to the socks in the drawer. Once they are folded uh, neatly in the beginning of the week, um, it looks very nice. So that's our chromatin in the young state. But after you go in and out and pull things, it starts to look like that, even if we are trying to put it back neatly, but it still doesn't work. So of course, the big question is how to reverse it, how to go from this drawer to this drawer. Uh, and um, that will be the <laughs> subject of my today's talk. Uh, there are some, several ways of doing it. Uh, and of course, nature figured it out because it happens every time a new life is conceived. Um, so when the baby is born, um, its epigenome is new um, and the age of zero. Uh, it's not the average age of both parents. So obviously there is an evolutionary process that can take care of it, but that gives rise to the next generation. And uh, what we would like to achieve is to apply the same strategy uh, to the somatic body. All right, so from this introduction, so this is the uh, gene uh, we've been studying for a long time. It's called sirtuin 6 uh, Raul Mostaslavsky gave a talk on the first day focusing on sirtuin 6 and primarily its role in cancer and metabolic functions. Uh, so sirt 6 was called longevity sirtuin uh, because of all sirtuin, sirtuins, uh, sirtuin 6 has the strongest uh, phenotype that's related to aging. If you knock it out, uh, you get these mice that are uh, very defective. They have some progeroid features. They have a lot of genomic instability uh, and they die by 30 days of age. Uh, so this is the work from Mostoslavsky when he was a postdoc, he generated these mice. Uh, and then Heim Cohen's lab generated mice overexpressing CERT6. And these mice live up to 20% longer, which is quite amazing. Uh, so our group has contributed a lot in understanding uh, the role of CERT2 and 6 uh, in DNA repair. Uh, so here is just a big summary from a recent review. Uh, so what we and others showed that CERT6 is recruited to the sites of double strand breaks. Uh, and it sort of prepares a platform for other factors to come in. And this is why it is upstream of multiple DNA repair pathways. Uh, so it plays a role of like probably cleaning, sort of preparing the platform, uh, uh, changing chromatin at the site, it also recruits PARP1, activates PARP1, and then recruits other factors that are important for DNA repair. So this is one function of CERT6. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, my lab is also well known for the studies of um, unusual model organisms, although in today's talk I will not be talking very much about it, but uh, we study various long-lived creatures uh, from naked morad uh, to bats and even bowhead whale. I could give you a whole different talk about bowhead whale. Uh, and the goal is to understand the longevity mechanisms that evolved in these species and then try to see how to apply them uh, to humans. Uh, so here we've done a little bit of that. Uh, we uh, took a collection of um, various rodents with lifespans ranging from three years to 40 years. Uh, we measured the efficiency of double strand break repair, and we found it to correlate very strongly with maximum lifespan. Uh, and sirtuin 6 uh, was the major determinant of, of this correlation. So it's been published in 2019, so I'm not going into details, but I just want to emphasize that what we found was that sirtuin 6 activity uh, correlated very strongly with maximum lifespan of the species. 
So that was uh, very interesting. And then we also uh, discovered another role of serotonin-6 uh, in epigenome maintenance. So this one, one is DNA repair, but it is also important in epigenome maintenance, which um, sort of parallels the, the role of yeast ser 2 where it, uh, it is responsible for gene silencing and for reinforcing uh, heterochromatin. Uh, so what ser 2 in 6 does, uh, it also maintains heterochromatin, uh, and it is important for silencing transposable elements. Uh, in these poor mice uh, that are missing ser 2 and 6, what happens is that heterochromatin really unravels. Uh, their centromeres open up and telomeres open up, and transposons become very activated. So that is you know, maybe another reason for their severe premature aging phenotype. Uh, so if this is what the chromatin looks like, um, a very large part of our genomic DNA uh, is occupied by transposons, these endogenous parasites uh, that, well, there are lines and signs that make about 30% of the genome, but then also DNA elements of endogenous retroviruses. So everything all together is more than 50%. Uh, of our DNA, so it maybe our chromatin looks like that, uh, with all of these parasites uh, sitting there. And of course, thinking just about um, the volume of these sequences, they must be playing a role uh, in epigenetic reorganization with aging. Uh, so this is a picture uh, from an old review that we wrote, uh, where we proposed that with aging, line ones uh, get activated, so they're like sleeping dogs. Uh, and uh, when we are young, everything is fine because the cell has multiple mechanisms to suppress these elements. Uh, but with aging, they awaken. And although initially we believe they just cause genomic instability by the virtue of you know, jumping around and cutting DNA, uh, but what later turned out, they also trigger inflammation, which is one of the hallmarks or new hallmarks of aging. So what specifically CERT-6 does in this, uh, and this is published uh, several years ago, um, it binds to five prime UTR regions of line one elements, and it recruits CAP1 and HP1, uh, packaging them into heterochromatin. So this is what happens in the young tissue, but in old tissue, CERT6 no longer binds there very well, so that contributes to activation uh, of these elements. Uh, and uh, what we demonstrated was that uh, with aging, uh, line one starts to accumulate in the cytoplasm in a sort of cDNA form, uh, and uh, this cDNA um, creates a problem because it then recognized by SIGA sting pathway and drives inflammation. Uh, so we were able to reverse this uh, by giving mice antiretroviral drugs and we could make those knockout mice live longer. Uh, so there were these two papers published uh, back to back, ours in cell metabolism and John Sedivit, our collaborator in nature, um, showing this mechanism of uh, inducing age-related inflammation through activation uh, of reactivation of line one transposons. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of the pathway that cDNA is formed, triggering SIGA sting signaling. Uh, and that can drive multiple age-related pathologies uh, because inflammation may be the root cause of um, diabetes and Alzheimer's and cancer. So pretty much all age-related diseases have inflammatory component in them. So these are the two functions of CERT6. Uh, and at that point, we became interested, um, since we know that there is a relationship between CERT6 activity and maximum lifespan, uh, is there a relationship uh, within species, for example, among our own species, humans, uh, if long-lived individuals uh, have more active CERT6. Uh, so this is a collaboration with the group of Yusin Su at Columbia University in Yusin Studies Human Centenarians. And Matt Simon was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Now he uh, moved on uh, to his independent position at Jackson Lab. Uh, so we got together with Yusin and uh, she was sequencing a human 
Ashkenazi Jewish centenarians, uh, and uh, she discovered several alleles in CERT6. One of these alleles uh, was enriched in centenarians, so that was uh, quite amazing. So this, this allele had two missense mutations in the C-terminus of CERT6. Uh, because that was a missense mutation, so we could um, engineer it and test uh, functional properties uh, of this protein. So first we looked at its enzymatic activities because CERT6 uh, can deacetylate its substrates, which also in includes some histone substrates. Uh, it can also mono-EDP ribosylate substrates. And this is the activity that was neglected for a long time, but we discovered multiple targets, including PARP1 and CAP1 and histone. Uh, so this activity is very important for epigenetic component of CERT6 function. Uh, and then we tested the centenarian CERT2 and 6. Uh, to our surprise, so here we are measuring the acetylation activity. Uh, the centenarian variant, and here we have one mutation, the second and cent is when both are together. Um, centenarian variant had actually weaker deacetylase activity. We didn't expect it. We thought it should be better in like every respect, but no, it, it still had deacetylase activity, but it just was not as strong. Uh, but its other activity, mono-EDP ribosylation, was enhanced dramatically compared to the wild-type human version. Uh, and then functionally, when we tested it in DNA repair assays, uh, centenarian CERT6 was better. So this is the wild-type uh, stimulation, uh, and this is with centenarian. So it's really better at DNA repair. It was also better at line one silencing. So here we are measuring line one expression uh, when we overexpress in the wild type allele, uh, individual mutations of both together, and you see that it can more efficiently uh, silence line one. So it seems to be a better enzyme, at least with these, with respect to these activities that are important for epigenome maintenance. Uh, we also looked into uh, the interacting partners uh, of CERT6. Uh, and we were hoping to find some differential interactors between the centenarian allele and the wild type allele. Uh, they all interacted with the same protein. So we didn't find anything that would interact with centenarian, but not with the wild type. Uh, but there were some proteins that were interacting more strongly with centenarian version. And that was lamin A was the best hit here, which is kind of exciting because lamin A provides the scaffold uh, for chromatin in the nucleus. It was known previously that CERT6 interacts with lamin A, uh, and now we see that centenarian version interacts much better. So lamin A is a very famous protein. It's associated with multiple human genetic syndromes. Uh, perhaps the best known is hutchinson gilford progeria, in which case lamin A is defective, so it results in premature aging. Uh, but there are also some polymorphisms with lamin A that are reported in centenarians, so I guess it could be, you know, have uh, worse function or it could be improved to provide better structure. So what we hypothesize is that uh, perhaps uh, the centenarian version of lamin A by virtue of binding more strongly, uh, sorry, of CERT6 by virtue of binding more strongly to lamin A um, is somehow better at maintaining uh, heterochromatin or chromatin organization altogether. Uh, and it is also interesting that it has uh, a different ratio between the two enzymatic activities um, that is more beneficial to longevity. Um, the acetylation activity is essential. So you cannot go successfully through development without this activity. So it's not to say that you don't need this activity, but maybe what we speculate that in adult organisms, just for the maintenance function, well, this is important for development, but for maintenance, uh, this activity may become uh, more important for an adult. So, okay, this is all very good. Uh, and centenarians, um, you know, they are lucky if they have this allele. It's also, it's a very rare allele, so not all centenarians have it, of course. Um, but what about, um, you know, most of the population who is not lucky enough to have this allele? So we started thinking, um, is there any way to, for everybody to benefit from 
more active since six. Uh, and this is the work uh, of uh, Min Sun Li, a graduate student in my lab, and Zhizhong Zheng, uh, who is a bioinformatician postdoc. Uh, and this was uh, is in collaboration with Steve Horvath and Ken Raj. So I'm going to show you unpublished data now, uh, which we are wrapping up, and <laughs> we are very excited about this. Uh, so what Min Sun did, uh, she took uh, primary human fibroblasts uh, that can rush isolated from people of older age, uh, 60 plus up to 90 years old, and they were very low passage, so they haven't yet forgotten where they came from. Uh, so we took those cells and then Minsoon uh, transfected these cells uh, with a uh, lentiviral vector expressing CERT6. And she did it for a fairly short time, just two weeks. Uh, and then we applied, applied Horvath's clock uh, to see whether it changed methylation age of the cells. Uh, and to our amazement, in nine out of 10 uh, donors, methylation age went down just after two weeks of cell 6 overexpression. So then based on the, we've done RNA-seq on these cells, and then based on Zhizhong's analysis, uh, we see that the, uh, functions that were changed uh, in these cells after cell 6 overexpression are uh, mostly related to anything that has to do with chromatin, like DNA conformation change, chromatin assembly, uh, DNA packaging. So all of these functions we would suspect uh, cell 6 to participate with. Um, we also analyzed uh, biotoxic and we found that some um, of the functions were enhanced and kind of became more open, some of the genes. Uh, so the goal term that was significantly enhanced was Swyce-Neef superfamily. So which tells us that it's not that CERT6 enzymatically does everything, but it perhaps affects other uh, epigenetic enzymes and uh, somehow changes uh, heterochromatin together with others. So maybe CERT6 has a more regulatory rather than directly enzymatic role uh, in instituting whatever change it does to reduce epigenetic age. Uh, we looked at histone modifications. We see increase in H3K9 trimethylation levels upon CERT6 overexpression. Uh, and then we start decided, okay, let's look at transposons. What happens to them? We know that CERT6 is important for silencing transposons. So from RNA sequencing result, uh, what we see that transposons are significantly silenced uh, and all of them, uh, lines and signs and even DNA transposons and also LTR transposons. So it reduces expression. Uh, then from attack sequence, uh, we see that uh, transposons show reduced accessibility again, all of these classes. Uh, well, I guess with exception of sign, uh, but the other three classes show reduced accessibility. Uh, and then we also analyze DNA methylation on, on transposons using MEDIP, so precipitation of methylated DNA and sequencing. And here we see that all classes of transposons massively gain methylation upon cell 6 overexpression. So it really takes those transposons and packages them back into heterochromatin where they belong. Uh, so that is all exciting, uh, but you know, this is the type of intervention we tried on these cells is uh, a gene therapy, which of course is possible, but it would be preferred to use some kind of pharmacological approach. Uh, and there was a, um, you know, effort going on to identify CERT6 activators, you know, just based on the findings in mice and lifespan extension. Uh, so there were several molecules identified that um, activate CERT6 deacetylation activity because that activity was the easiest to screen for. Uh, so we just took those published molecules that modulate uh, CERT6 activity and tested whether they also enhanced CERT6 ribosylation, because now from the centenarian uh, study, we know that this is the one we want to enhance. Um, so strangely, most of these molecules do absolutely nothing to mono-ADP ribosylation, which means the two activities are separate. You 
you cannot stimulate both with the same molecule, with the exception of one molecule called fucoidin uh, that was first identified by Ruin Muadel uh, from NIA. Uh, and that was reported to be a very strong activator of CERT6 deacetylation. And we see it to be also amazing activator of CERT6 monodipyribosylation. So that, okay, <laughs> let's look into this molecule. So this molecule isn't something that uh, perhaps um, you know, medicinal chemists would be excited about because it's a natural product and it is a polysaccharide. Uh, so it is derived from brown seaweed. So you can see these various version of, versions of it. So it's not, a, it's not a very defined structure. So it's a mixture of monomers of fucose uh, that can be connected together in various ways. It can be linear or branched. It can be also sulfated. Uh, so some uh, preparations of fucoidin would be more active than others. Uh, and uh, we decided, okay, let's try to see if uh, fucoidin, uh, because it in vitro it's such a strong activator of CERT6, is it going to do anything in vivo, in mice? And this is the work of Ali Shada, a technician, uh, and uh, excellent lab manager. So what Ali did, he took some fucoidin, and well, I would to also say that brown seaweed uh, is uh, a very popular food source, uh, especially in Asian countries such as Japan, South Korea, that have uh, the longest life expectancies. <laughs> so of course we could only speculate that this is because people eat seaweed, but you know, because it is so safe, I can uh, with. Uh, clean consciousness say, okay, everybody, let's eat seaweed. It's good for you. <laughs> Even if, you know, through CERT-6 or not through CERT-6, it's good for you. Uh, so what Ali did, he took a preparation of uh, brown seaweed that we showed to be very active in vitro on CERT-6. Uh, and then he uh, gave it to mice. So we started from... Um, sort of middle to older age mice at 14 months old. Uh, we gave them fucoidin as a powder mixed with chow and also in water um, and just kept these mice. Um, we started noticing after a few months that there were some differences in the coat. So here are control mice and fucoidin mice seem to have much better coat. Uh, but when we applied the more comprehensive frailty score to these mice. And this frailty score is very similar to geriatric frailty score with grip strength and walking speed. Uh, we see significant difference. So mice receiving fucoidin uh, are less frail. And over time, of course, frailty score increases as mice are getting older, but there is the difference is maintained. So this is very encouraging. Uh, and right now we are setting up to do a human clinical trial where we want to give fucoidin to cancer patients uh, after they've been treated with chemo uh, and declared cancer-free. So at this point, people really suffer from frailty uh, that's induced by chemotherapy. So we'll be uh, giving people fucoidin and see if it relieves frailty because um, most likely DNA damage induced by chemotherapy really wreaks havoc in the epigenome. <clears throat> and that would be nice uh, to have some help uh, from CER2 and 6. So we'll see where that goes. Um, so just to summarize what I would like to say is that, yes, we have um, a lot of transposons in our genome. Uh, they must be exerting some cost on us, our, the host. Uh, and um, it's not entirely clear what is going on. Well, it, it is pretty clear that loss of heterochromatin is one of epigenetic changes that happen very consistently with age. Um, and transposons become reactivated. Um, but uh, if you think about development at different stages, that is actually quite peculiar because uh, in ES cells or iPS cells, transposons are very active. Uh, but there are also various mechanisms that trying to minimize their negative impact. There are all sorts of PV, RNAs, and other strategies that degrade them. So then when cells differentiate uh, in young but differentiated cells, transposons are packaged very tightly, and they 
relatively inactive, and that's when there is a lot of CERT6 bound to chromatin. Um, with aging, situation starts to change. So in old cell or in senescent cell, um, it starts to resemble in some way uh, the ear cell again, because uh, chromatin changes, some things unravel, uh, transposons become reactivated again, but um, you know that's a bad situation. So while this situation is uh, very nice and uh, tolerable in ES cells, it's not tolerable in the old cells. So we're still trying to understand how to put all of these factors together. And uh, Vadim Gladyshev was talking yesterday about uh, this rejuvenation that happens in during gastrulation, uh, but it also coincides to when transposons become finally start to get silenced after uh, the initial few divisions where transposons are very active. <clears throat> that at this stage, methylation starts to be reinforced on them. So there are all these processes uh, happening in parallel. Um, and of course, the question is, how do we go from these cells uh, either back here? Well, this can be achieved by complete reprogram monaco factor reprogramming, or preferably here if we want to rejuvenate somatic cells. Uh, so this can perhaps be done with CERT6. So back to this picture that we started with, uh, how do we rejuvenate the epigenome? Uh, so it can be done by Yamanaka reprogramming, but that would be more like taking this drawer, throwing all the socks away, and then <laughs> refolding them and putting them back, uh, which sometimes uh, may have its uh, dangers. Or we could be more conservative and just, just package heterochromatin, and this can be done with the help of CERT6 or perhaps other epigenetic factors that would not change cell identity, but reinstate heterochromatin uh, the way it was. So let me summarize. Uh, epigenetic drift leads to loss of heterochromatin during aging. Uh, transposons are activated. Um, transposons can drive inflammation uh, through formation of cDNA uh, and Siga sting pathway because the cell thinks that these are you know, infective agents, well, even though they sit within us, um, this can be rescued by various ways, for example, antiretroviral drugs, or, but this is already acting somewhat downstream after transposons, uh, you know, got on the loose, you can try to uh, sort of silence the signaling pathways uh, or silence the propagation. And maybe the even better way is to, we package them back into heterochromatin uh, so that they prevent their expression altogether. And this may lead to some degree of rejuvenation. So I would like to thank uh, members of my group. I was naming people as I was going along. So the work I, I showed you today, well, the work of many people, uh, Shao Tian, he worked on comparative DNA repair. Matt Simon worked on Centenarian CERT6 uh, and uh, uh, the story of transposons. Um, Ali uh, did the work with uh, Foucauldin and mice. Uh, Min Sun and Zhejong work on uh, rejuvenation. And all of this was done in collaboration with Andrei Sulanov, who is my uh, lifetime collaborator. Uh, so here, all the group is at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting. And uh, we do have postdoctoral and graduate student positions available. So if you're interested in working on this subject or on whales or bats, please um, get in touch with me. Uh, and we have uh, amazing outside collaborators. Um, well, some of them were giving talks in this meeting. Uh, Vadim Gladyshev gave a talk yesterday. We collaborate with him and uh, with Steve Horvath and uh, John Sedevi's group. We collaborate on uh, the subject of transposons and many others. And I'm happy to take questions. Excellent job, Vera. Really great, great talk. Um, so there's there's lots of questions coming in. We probably won't get through all of them. And I'd, I'd like to start with the first question. And that is, um, so CERT6 is a obviously an, an NAD dependent enzyme. And you know, there's a lot of interest in NAD supplements. So has anyone looked specifically at NAD supplements, NR or NMN on specific CERT6 activities, either, you know, ribosylation or, 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 or deacetylation. I guess deacetylation would be the first one to look at. 
Have people looked specifically at CERT-6? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question, Peter. Um, you know, among the seven sirtuins, uh, sirtuin-6 is the least sensitive of NAD. Uh, it has a pretty good binding to it, so even a little bit of NAD is enough for it perhaps to keep it active. So it's much less of a subject of, you know, this fine regulation uh, using NAD. Um, so that's why I think that NAD supplementation alone may not be sufficient um, to activate cell 6 So we have to really look for more specific activators. I see. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, a bunch of questions. Uh, Mar Marta Kovacheva has a very interesting question and is, is wondering, I guess in a nutshell, whether the, the compromised CERT-6 deacetylase activity, you know, is that likely to be functionally relevant? Is it perhaps even, in, even beneficial or is it just, you know, some kind of uh, irrelevant passenger effect to the, the important thing that's going on with, with ribosylation? And, and I guess as a follow-up to that is then interested in the effects of fucoidin on um, deacetylase. Does, fu does fucoidin affect deacetylase activity? Yes, it stimulates both. Uh, so it's a really very strong activator of both activities. Um, now to the first part of the question, uh, whether is it functionally relevant or not. So in vitro, we see this reduced activity. Uh, in collaboration with Ben Garcia, we looked with a quantitative mass spec, whether there is a difference in vivo uh, in CERT-6 targets, um, you know, in the cells that have centenarian version of CERT-6. Uh, and in vivo, we actually didn't see it. Uh, so I think in vitro, when we measure kinetics, it's apparent, but in vivo, when CERT-6 has enough time to deacetylate whatever needs to be deacetylated, um, it probably still <clears throat> keeps up with its job. Uh, so it's interesting, we have other mutants with separation of function, uh, and we have one mutant that has almost no deacetylation activity, and that results in, in much enhanced uh, ribosylation and also enhanced DNA repair function. So maybe, um, you know, having some reduction in this activity actually helps <laughs> promote the DNA repair function. Okay, okay. Um, so Zhijun Do has a question. Do you want to unmute and ask your question, Zhijun? Oh, hi, Vera. Hi, Vera Do here. So I, I have a question about the this concept about aging is associated with broad loss and disruption of heterochromatin. I know I had this argument with Peter Adams a while ago because we see in senescent cell, uh, you know, they have this very strong heterochromatin foci, the SAF. And so indicating that the chromatin, at least in, in subtype of the senescent cells, are actually more compact and then they may have actually have more heterochromatin. All right. So I wonder what's your comment on whether there's more compact chromatin, or is a global disruption of the heterochromatin during aging or senescence? Yes, that's right. I, I guess, you know, maybe I, that was somewhat a simplification on my side to say, well, there's just opening. Yes, in senescence, there is a disruption. So there are certain things that, you know, turn into more compact heterochromatin when they shouldn't. Um, so of course, various things happen, but with respect to, transposable elements, that's mostly loss of heterochromatin. And um, I think that uh, what you discovered together with Peter, uh, this cytoplasmic DNA fragments uh, that are formed through autophagy mechanisms, that's, I guess, yet another um, pathway that can trigger inflammation through DNA damage. So of course, transposon is not the only pathway, but there are several. And there is another one through mitochondrial DNA. So we don't yet know the relative contribution of all of these pathways, but perhaps all three of them together. And maybe also the D loops, the transcriptional loops as well, again, through C-gusting. Uh, so there are maybe four of such pathways that uh, promote age-related sterile inflammation. So a uh, related quick question to the previous question about the 36 mutation in the Centurion. Uh, are there any trade-offs? For example, are there any defect in this uh, in, in this center RNA, as you see, like infection or fertility, or any trade-offs as you are aware of? 
Well, not that we are aware of. We know that they made it past 100, so they must be <laughs> they must be in good shape. Um, what so about the future? <laughs> yeah, no, nothing apparent. Um, you know, I, I don't really know all the health history on these people because, well, we just uh, took these samples from uh, the cohort and um, we didn't have access to all of this information. We just know that they lived, pa pa you know, past 100 and they had a familial history of longevity. Uh, but, you know, based on the studies in uh, CERT-6 overexpressing mice, uh, they don't seem to have any problem. Okay. Thank you. A couple of quick questions from the chat uh, for the Q&A. Um, Marie Van Drom asks, uh, does fucoidin activate other sirtuins aside from CERT-6? Oh, you know, we didn't test it. I'm trying to remember from uh, the original paper of Ruin, where they, uh, I think they might, although, you know, I'm afraid to say something wrong. I, I don't know. You know, my feeling is they don't because that was published as a specific activator and I think Ruin probably looked at others as well. Okay. And a uh, question from Sarah Elgin. Um, are there any clinical, any trials underway using fucoidin um, as an intervention for long COVID, which is obviously no. information related? That, that would be perhaps interesting to try. Do you think? Well, thank you for this suggestion. Yeah, we should definitely try to propose it, especially there is a huge unmet need and it is a very safe treatment. And so there are several papers of uh, clinical trials conducted with fucoidin in Japan, where for a long time it was considered to be a healthy supplement. Uh, it was shown to do a variety of things which we could all potentially link um, to CERT-6, although we don't know for sure. Uh, for example, it was shown to improve uh, response to influenza vaccination in elderly, uh, pretty much like that uh, famous rapamycin trial. So Foucaultian did the exact same thing. Uh, it also improved the uh, uh, quality of life in cancer patients, which was you know, one of the reasons we decided to uh, go through similar pathway with cancer patients. So it was just administered to cancer patients and the overall the frail, you know, survival and frailty scores were improved. So that was another small trial in Japan. So it has all of these health benefits. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Ognian uh, has, a, has a question, has his hand raised. Ognian, do you wanna unmute and ask? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Um, um, it, uh, CERT 6 looks uh, yeah, very fascinating. It's been around for a few years already. It's uh, already, I think, relatively famous. It looks very promising, uh, and with, especially with your uh, new evidence, uh, it uh, silences transposons, it uh, uh, reinstates heterochromatin, uh, and it has all these beneficial effects. Uh, however, I was thinking, uh, do you know or have you looked at what might be the possible drawback for adverse consequence of overexpressing CERT-6, because I'm thinking if it was so universally beneficial, it is a relatively straightforward mutation to increase its activity or its um, expression. In fact, you've identified in centenarius a mutation that increases um, activity. So uh, evolution, I would expect, would have selected that if it were universally helpful, and we should all be centenarians by now, but we're not. So I'm thinking there must be some hidden cost that we're not looking at perhaps well i think your question is you know it has evolutionary component uh, because the question is like uh well it's possible to uh, you know evolve a mammalian organism that would live to 200 years like bowhead whale uh, but we don't all live 200 years because um lifespan evolution is very much dependent on uh, uh, sort of, you know, genetic benefits. So like mice do not live 80 years uh, because they cannot survive that long. There are too many predators. So they maximize their reproductive output in their first year of life. Um, so to put it in other words, I think we don't all have super active CERT-6 because there was really no selective pressure. We have just enough CERT-6 to take us through our reproductive 
years and a little bit beyond, but if we want <laughs> to, to improve it, then we have to do some, we have to modify the system, engineer it better, because right now it's the same like with DNA repair or epigenome maintenance. Well, we have just enough for what our evolutionary needs used to be <laughs> in our evolutionary past. So I don't think, you know, everything would, that hasn't been optimized is because there are some drawbacks, although, of course, you're correct, there might be some. Uh, so far, I can't really name any, but of course, we have to be, we have to look carefully. Uh -huh. But uh, sorry, as a follow-up to this, I don't know if anyone has looked, the CIRT-6 increase also reproductive lifespan? Because if that is the case, then, because if it is keeping organisms healthier for longer, it might also increase reproductive and uh, lifespan, and therefore it should be also helpful for evolutionary success. Uh, you know, I don't think it was in the original uh, Heim Coins paper. We are going to look into that. We now generated our own cell 6 overexpressing mice. And the reason perhaps it wasn't in the original study uh, was that that was a randomly integrated transgene. It wasn't even overexpressed everywhere, like in where you need it to be, you know, in germline. Uh, so right now we have mice with cell 6 in the ROSA26 locus, so we can express it in any tissue we want. So we are definitely uh, going to address this question and see whether there will be benefit. Of course, one might imagine maybe not, maybe if a lot of effort is going into, you know, maintaining perfect genome, uh, maybe then not enough resources would be left for reproduction. That's also a possible answer to your question. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, in the interest of time, we're already over. I think we should we should we should move on. Thank, thanks very much, Vera. Um, there are a lot of questions in the chat in the Q and A. I hope you uh, managed to get to, to, okay. to some of them. Um, thank you, thank you for um, great discussion. And um, so, yeah, next speaker is uh, Payal Sen from uh, the the NIH, and she's going to talk about uh, epigenetic mechanisms of of tissue aging. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you can see my slides. Yeah, looks good. All right. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking Peter and the Active Motif team for, uh, you know, organizing this wonderful event. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, the last two days, and I don't think there are too many uh, you know, symposia or conferences, just looking at epigenetic uh, epigenetics of aging. So this was really, um, you know, uh, very, very uh, helpful. Uh, so I am a tenure track investigator at the National Institute on Aging. And uh, in fact, I celebrated my four year work anniversary just two, year, uh, two, two days ago. Uh, so we are a newish lab, but maybe not brand new anymore. But the last four years has been uh, dedicated to really understanding how the epigenome fundamentally changes uh, during aging. Uh, so I'd like to start off by showing you this perhaps overused slide on uh, the nine hallmarks of aging. So uh, this was the, uh, you know, the first iteration of the hallmarks of aging from back in 2013. And a number of speakers, I think, um, you know, referred to the 2023 version where three more hallmarks have been added. But epigenetic alterations remain one of the original and primary hallmarks of aging because it occurs pretty upstream in the aging process. But the term epigenetic alterations, at least used in this context, really doesn't mean much because we don't know what modifications it is talking about. We don't know which direction it goes, whether it is specific for a certain model organism or conserved across species. So that's why we wanted to gain some insight into this. So now a few years ago, um, you know, my postdoc mentor, Dr. Shelley Berger, myself, and a few other co-authors, we wrote uh, what at the time was a comprehensive review trying to compile information from, uh, you know, multiple published studies to see if we can come up with some thematic 
epigenetic principles of aging. And I have to say that, you know, this uh, review is a little dated right now, so I'm very sure there are multiple additions to this, but these basic thematic principles, I think, still hold. So I'm going to go over these uh, very quickly. So the first is histone loss during aging, and this was discussed in the on the first day, if I remember. Uh, so uh, what happens, uh, so this was work from Jessica Tyler's group uh, who showed that in replicatively aged yeast cells, there was loss of 50% of the nucleosomes and the rest of the nucleosomes had fuzzy nucleosomal positioning. And what this um, uh, resulted in was general transcriptional activation or uh, an upregulation of transcription of almost all genes of the uh, yeast genome. Um, I have to say that such transcriptional amplification has not been uh, noted in human cells, but definitely the loss of histones is very clear, and uh, especially in senescent cells, you can see it. Uh, the next is imbalance of histone modifications. So the histone code per se does not change with aging. And, and uh, just to mention here, uh, you know, David Alice, who um, unfortunately passed away a few um, uh, days ago, um, you know, the, the code that he established that certain activating modifications activate transcription, others repress transcription, still holds um, during um, aging, except that the relative abundance of these modifications globally or locally change with age. So my lab, um, you know, kind of um, tries to understand um, uh, this aspect of aging, and I'll be talking today about one single modification and, and, and it's an unpublished study. The third is DNA methylation changes, and this is perhaps the most better, uh, like it's the better studied of all epigenetic modifications. And we've heard, you know, excellent talks from uh, Vadim and, um, you know, many other people who've uh, alluded to clocks, and we'll hear from Morgan Levine as well. Uh, so, of course, these methylation changes occur with age, but the exact functional consequence, as we were discussing yesterday, is not uh, very clear. Uh, but perhaps I will provide one little link in the course of my talk. The fourth is chromatin remodeling. Um, uh, these are um, uh, ATP dependent chromatin remodelers. Much, um, uh, we don't know much about them at all during aging, except that ATP levels decline in humans with age. But we heard a wonderful talk from Doe, for example, uh, you know, implicating the WSTF, uh, ISY type remodeler in senescence and aging, and Vera also talked about this uh, Switzniff complex. Uh, but again, to emphasize, this is a pretty understudied aspect, epigenetic aspect. Um, the next one is focal heterochromatin formation. So this is clearly seen in senescent cells under the microscope in the form of senescence-associated heterochromatic foci. These are dappy, dense structures that have a peculiar organization with specific histone modifications. But again, we don't know what their exact function is. And of course, upstream of all of this is a singular event, and that is the breakdown of the nuclear lamina. And uh, this breakdown occurs because lamin B1 is downregulated at the mRNA level, as well as through autophagic degradation, as Doe uh, mentioned. And, uh, and, and it is also exemplified in progeria patients, for example, who uh, hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome patients who have a laminae mutation. They have breakdown of nuclear lamina, misshapen nuclei, detachment of chromatin from the nuclear lamina, and this manifests in uh, premature aging um, 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 syndrome. Uh, and of course, there are consequences to all these changes, and uh, the consequences mainly, um, uh, you know, transcriptional changes. For example, I talked a little bit about transcriptional amplification, but of course, there are general gene expression changes, such as upregulation of inflama inflammation genes. And then we and others, including Wei Wei Dang, have also reported some spurious transcription events uh, during uh, senescence and aging. So uh, the main purpose of this slide was to uh, basically tell you that uh, you know, epigenetic um, alterations are pretty diverse and very complex, uh, and much work is still needed before we can 
really comprehensively understand what's going on uh, uh, during aging. And I was really happy to hear Bing Ren's talk yesterday because you know uh, he's been involved in the ENCODE project, and 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 we have to apply those kind of robust uh, you know platforms and uh, principles, uh, but in the context of aging. Um, so our lab is involved, um, you know, um, involved in this, um, you know, whole uh, quest to find out what's going on with the epigenome with age. Uh, but we do this at a very small scale. So we use um, uh, C57 black six mice from the NIA rodent colony. Uh, we also have some transgenic models and we take a few tissues and then we do perform a bunch of chromatin based assays to understand what's going on. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we use several tissues, but today I'm going to be primarily talking about one tissue, and that is uh, uh, the liver. So why the liver? Um, well, the liver is the primary metabolic organ. It has clear age-related changes, uh, and we've uh, heard, you know, Aaron on the first day, and then Celia yesterday, uh, who talked about, you know, some of these age-related changes. Um, but technically speaking, the liver is a pretty easy organ to work with. Uh, it's large, you get tons of material. Um, and um, again, uh, relative to other organs, it is a pretty homogeneous um, uh, organ, because it has about 60 to 70% um, hepatocytes. So, um, Regarding age-related changes, we know that you know it enlarges a little with age. Um, there's de deposition of fat with age, uh, resulting in steatosis. But the reason why we uh, really chose the liver is because it is one of the very unique organs in that you can cut off about 70% of it and the rest of it will regrow in mass and function in about 10 days in mice and about 30 days in humans. Therefore, we think the uh, the liver is an opportune system to study not only the changes, the epigenetic changes that occur with aging, but also the reversibility of these changes using the regeneration paradigm. So with that, uh, with this model, we asked our first question, and that was uh, what histone modifications are changing with age in the liver? Uh, so to address this question, we collaborated with Simone Sidoli at Albert Einstein, and we performed mass spec of extracted histones. Here I'm showing you a volcano plot of the modifications that either go up with age in red or down with age in blue. And one particular modification really attracted our attention, and that is H3K27 trimethylation. So I'm sure everybody knows uh, in this audience that this is a very well-known uh, repressive mark. Uh, it's put on by you know, the polycomb PRC2 complex. Uh, but the reason why we focused on this modification is because it seemed to us to be a recurrent feature in published literature in aging. So for example, we mined uh, data, again, mass spec data from mouse muscle stem cells, and we found K27 increases with age. And the same was true um, uh, from um, uh, human postmortem brain tissue. So, um, so having seen this modification pop up several times, um, we, we kind of concluded that there was a global increase in this modification, at least from mass spec. So we wanted to validate this in other, um, using other orthogonal methods. So we performed Western blot. You can see here the K27 um, um, levels go up. Uh, this is from liver lysates of mouse uh, of mice of different ages. We also did immunofluorescence studies. We found the intensity was um, um, uh, significantly higher in old hepatocyte nuclei. And in collaboration with the microscopy core in uh, Johns Hopkins, we performed trans transmission electron microscopy coupled to immunogold labeling. Um, and looking at the location of K27 trimethylation in the ultrastructure of hepatocytes. And these black dots represent those gold particles. So you can see in the old, not only are there more gold particles, but they tend to form these kind of clusters, which suggest some sort of self interaction. So next, we ask the question, where in the genome is K27 trimethylation localized? And to, do uh, to, to answer this question, we performed the regular chip assay, uh, and we called PEAKS um, genome-wide. So 
Uh, this is a PCA plot of uh, the called peaks, um, and you can see uh, that uh, it can nicely segregate young and old samples. Uh, here I'm showing you only three replicates, but we've done this over 10 replicates and still there is a nice segregation. But very uh, interestingly, we found that we actually call less number of peaks in the old. And this is quite opposite to what I just told you, that there is a global increase of K27. Uh, during aging. So just hold that thought because I'm going to be addressing this discrepancy in the next few slides. So since we called peaks, we went ahead and performed differential um, peak analysis using DiffBind. And not surprisingly, we found many more unique peaks in the young, only two unique peaks in the old. And if you look at the uh, signal at these peak sites, you can clearly see that this, this signal is lost in the old. So we wondered where are these peaks that are sort of losing enrichment during aging. Uh, so they were annotated mostly uh, to promoter regions, but very interestingly, promoter regions of genes that encode for development and differentiation factors. So, um, uh, so for people who uh, know the polycom literature, this may not be very, um, you know, uh, surprising because K27 trimethylation marks lineage uh, specifying um, gene promoters. But the very fact that, you know, this signal was being lost with age kind of told us that, uh, you know, perhaps there's a loss of cell identity. So to investigate that further, we, um, you know, uh, correlated our ChIP-seq studies to RNA-seq studies. Here I'm showing you uh, one differential peak, uh, and you can see the loss of K27 trimethylation at this um, uh, gene promoter. But when you look at the RNA-seq, it is quite the opposite. So in other words, the loss of K27 trimethylation here leads to derepression of this gene. And of course, we did this across all differential peaks, and we saw a negative correlation. Of course, the correlation is not super strong, but it shows you that at least a subset of these genes might be derepressed as it's losing K27 trimethylation. And we wanted to validate this uh, sort of in an, uh, using another independent um, uh, metric. So we decided to plot uh, you know, H3K36 trimethylation signal, which, as you know, is a, uh, you know, active transcription, um, uh, positively correlated with active transcription. And indeed, we found that, you know, over the gene bodies of these genes, uh, we have higher K36 trimethylation signal. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, knowing that, you know, polycomb and perhaps DNA methylation may have some sort of a crosstalk, we also looked at DNA methylation at um, these sites. And we did not have, you know, methylation, um, uh, methylation information uh, from our mice, but we decided to uh, mine some already published data from Steve Horvath's group, and um, uh, we extracted the CPGs that overlapped with our differential peaks. And this is actually data from about 339 uh, mice. And you can see that progressively with age, these sites that are losing K27 trimethylation are actually gaining um, gaining uh, CPG methylation. And this result is actually quite complementary to some very recent work from, you know, from um, uh, uh, Steve Horvath and Vera and other people. And I think there's also a bioarchive paper now from Vittorio Sebastiano's group uh, that now uses uh, PRC2 clocks to kind of, uh, you know, predict biological age. So basically, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, both the Horvath study and our study kind of uh, say that uh, these PRC2 target sites are very important and that they actually contain certain CPG clocks, clock sites that are hypermethylated with age. So that's all about peaks. Um, but the question remains, um, where is the age-related excess H3K27 trimethylation? Because I just showed you a few slides ago that there's a global increase in this modification. Um, so to address this, we, uh, we did a PC analysis again, this time of genome coverage and not just peaks. And you can see again, nice um, segregation between young and old samples, suggesting that genomic regions outside of peaks 
are a major source of variation between young and old groups. So we frantically looked across the genome where uh, this excess K27 was, and it was only in the whole chromosome view that we actually saw these changes. So here in black are young samples and old are, um, uh, in blue are old samples, and this is just an overlapped plot. And I'm going to zoom in on one of these, uh, you know, broad domains, and there are many. Uh, here I am only showing chromosome five, but this occurs across all chromosomes uh, that we've seen. And you can see here the accumulation of K27 trimethylation in old over megabase sized domains. So of course, this is a pretty unique feature in aging. So we wondered what are these broad domains? But in order to um, uh, you know, answer this question, we needed to somehow bioinformatically call these broad domains. Now, uh, conventional peak calling algorithms will not work because these are regions of, you know, uh, relatively uh, low enrichment compared to peaks, but they uh, kind of accumulate over these really uh, large regions of the genome. So we came upon this um, particular tool from Philip Collis lab called EDD or Enriched Domain Detector for Chipsy Data. And by tweaking um, a few parameters of this EDD calling, um, you know, domain calling algorithm, we uh, kind of got very nice, um, uh, you know, overlap um, um, over broad domain. So these uh, black bars represent our EDD domain calls. And you can see um, uh, here, for example, it, it nicely, you know, identifies this region as a broad domain. And here at the bottom, I'm plotting the gene density. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that broad domains um, are usually gene poor. And this kind of rang a bell, which I'm going to bring up in my next slide. So given the ability to extract these geno genomic sites, these broad domains, we could now query a bunch of other uh, chromatin changes over these regions. So um, of course, uh, this is our kind of control experiment. We call these broad domains, and of course, we found enrichment of K27 trimethylation in old samples in blue. Uh, but because these regions were gene poor, and we know that lamin-associated do uh, domains or LADs um, are gene poor, we decided to look for lamin enrichment. And indeed, lamin B1 was highly enriched uh, over these broad domains. And as has been reported in literature, lamin B1 is uh, lost um, uh, uh, during aging. Of course, this change is modest, um, um, uh, and uh, but still statistically significant. And um, uh, just to remind you that our mice are only 18 months old. So perhaps in geriatric mice, we would see a uh, you know more drastic loss and then very um, you know uh, interestingly and uh, a dramatic change that we observed was in H3K9 trimethylation uh, which also uh, like Bing Ren's talk uh, yesterday um, uh, showed. So here, these broad domains with age were losing K9 trimethylation. And again, as has been reported in literature, but perhaps what we've contributed here is that there is actually a compensatory gain in H3K27 trimethylation. So we think that the loss of heterochromatin model of aging could be revised to state loss of constitutive heterochromatin um, um, uh, in uh, model of aging. Um, so in other words, our study um, implicates that there is a gain of facultative heterochromatin. We also looked at several other modifications um, um, and factors in this um, uh, bro broad domain. For example, we did not find any enrichment of H2A119 ubiquitination, which is put on by the PRC1 complex. So these are not your classical PRC1 repressed structures. We also did not find enrichment of K36 trimethylation. They are gene poor. Uh, we didn't find much uh, methyl uh, DNA methylation here, and neither um, RNA-Pol2. Uh, so then we wondered, um, you know, given that these are uh, enriched with K27 trimethylation, are they really just benign enrichments, or are they actually uh, you know, packaged into heterochromatin. So, so this is just a summary showing you that these are the three major changes. 
So, so to address whether they are actually heterochromatin or not, we uh, performed um, a classic biochemical experiment called salt fractionation, which was pioneered by Steve Henikoff's lab. So we took nuclei from young and old livers, uh, we um, treated them with MNAs, and then did a sequential salt extraction. The concept being that at low salt concentrations, you're mainly going to extract euchromatin, and at high salt concentrations, you're mostly going to extract heterochromatin. So we took the DNA, made them into libraries, and we sequenced them and then mapped them back to the genome. So this is, again, the same chromosome 5, just for simplicity. And uh, these are the soil fraction signals over the chromosome. Uh, and of course, it's very busy. So I'm going to zoom in on that one broad domain that I showed you before. And as you can see, perfectly overlapping with this broad domain is signal from the high soil fraction, but only in the old suggesting then that these regions are really heterochromatinized. And if we looked at the young um, samples, the same fractions did not have this signal. So then we wondered what is the consequence of this broad heterochromatinization, uh, facultative heterochromatinization. So we had two uh, hypotheses in mind. One is that it should um, you know, prevent access to genome cutting enzymes. So we decided to use a titration of MNAs. And as you can see from this um, uh, you know, gel picture, um, the uh, old uh, chromatin was difficult to digest with MNAs. And this is particularly uh, you know, uh, true at this 2000 unit titration where you have many more oligonucleosomes, but the young samples in blue seem to be uh, digested. And the second hypothesis we had was it could also prevent access to transcription factors and RNAPOL2 overall. And that would uh, lead to a global reduction in transcription. So uh, generally, people don't measure global transcription. Uh, what we decided to do was to use a spike in RNA-seq method um, um, and, and, and check for global transcription levels, global R mRNA levels. So uh, uh, this particular uh, method uses uh, your uh, ERCC transcripts, which are commercially available. They are synthetic transcripts. And uh, what we uh, uh, they uh, come in two flavors, mix one and mix two. They have the same four group of transcripts in different colors, but in different proportions. For example, you know, the A is four times more in mix one compared to mix two and so on. So we added mix one to young RNA, mix two to old RNA, and performed our RNA-seq as usual. So the way you measure global transcription is to plot your observed mix one to mix two ratio, which is from your sequencing data, and then um, uh, against the expected mix one to mix two ratio, which is from your uh, known concentrations of these transcripts. So if the two were similar, then uh, you know, our data points should have aligned with this dotted diagonal, but instead you can see that, you know, they are well below the diagonal, which kind of translates to the fact that there is an overall reduction in transcription in old. And this we found across all of our young old comparisons, so multiple animals. Um, so, so, so then comes the, you know, more difficult question. So what drives these HVK 27 uh, patterns during aging, these opposing patterns of peak loss and domain gain. Um, so we decided to address, uh, you know, one at a time. So we first focused on the peak loss. So we know that, uh, you know, these developmental gene promoters, um, you know, are likely to bind the PRC2 complex. So PRC2, uh, you know, has a Four, uh, four subunit catalytic core, uh, the methyl transferase being either EZH2 or EZH1. And then of course it has some accessory subunits. So instead of performing CHIP for all of these different subunits, we took the lazy approach. We uh, decided to use a bioinformatic tool called LISA, uh, which can predict um, uh, you know, upstream binding factors. And of course the top hit was EZH2, but we also found other, um, you know, PRC2 and PRC1 uh, uh, subunit binding, evidence of subunit binding there. Um, and to validate this, we performed EZH2 chip and um, we found, you know, a strong signal at these sites. Uh, and of course, the EZH2 binding was lost in the old. So in other words, the peak 
um, uh, observation can be explained by the loss of EZH2 at these sites. And this is a, a few uh, genome browser shots just to tell you like, you know, the loss was pretty dramatic. Um, but then why is EZH2 binding uh, lost at these sites? So we wondered whether this was a specific binding defect or was it that globally perhaps EZH2 is going down with aging? So we decided to do a simple Western um, and you can see, you know, even though there is a global increase of K27 trimethylation with age, there is a loss of EZH2. Uh, so then uh, this means that at least at those peak sites, loss of EZH2 overall and therefore loss of binding explains why we lose K27. However, we noted that EZH1, which is a paralog of EZH2, goes up with aging. So then we wondered whether this upregulation of EZH1 then explains the gain in broad domains. So unfortunately, the EZH1 antibody does not work for CHIP. So we decided to use our salt fraction data. Um, so if you remember, these high salt fractions represent the broad domains. We found that EZH1 could be detected in these high salt fractions, but we also found some remnant EZH2, suggesting that there is no specificity at those broad domains per se. It was both EZH1 and the remnant EZH2 that were probably leading to its um, um, accumulation. So... The, the, this interplay between EZH1 and EZH2 kind of reminded, of reminded us of something that's well established in literature. So EZH2 is a very pro-proliferative um, you know, uh, uh, protein, whereas EZH1 is more associated with quiescence. So we wondered whether these K27 patterns in aging could be mimicked by quiescence cultures. So we took Hep G2 cells, so they are, you know, liver hepatoblast stoma cells, and we decided to um, uh, establish quiescence using contact inhibition. And we indeed found K27 goes up with age, EZH2 goes down with age, and EZH1 not age uh, with quiescence. EZH1 goes up uh, uh, with quiescence uh, establishment, suggesting then that, you know, prolonged quiescence is something and that perhaps mimics um, what we see in uh, the aged liver. So then we asked one final question. So if prolonged quiescence is what is causing these kind of epigenetic, um, you know, K27 patterns, would breaking the quiescence restore youthful epigenome? So we decided to use the liver regeneration model to break quiescence because liver regeneration induces cell proliferation. So just to remind you, we can take the liver, we can cut off 70% of it, and the rest of it will regrow in mass, in, in mass and function uh, over 10 days in mice. So we took the before regeneration sample and the 10-day post-regeneration sample and compared the epigenome uh, or K27 profiles. Uh, we did four measurements. First, we found that the broad domains were reduced in the old regenerated livers. We found that the peaks that were lost in, in the old samples at those developmental genes were regained upon regeneration. Genes that were derepressed with aging were re-repressed upon regeneration. And then finally, when we looked at um, you know, some liver-enriched genes, we found that the old regenerated sample looked more like the young compared to the old. And then finally, and this is uh, you know, very uh, preliminary data, new data, in collaboration with Vadim's lab, we sent our samples, um, we sent our RNA-seq data and um, you know, asked uh, them to compute uh, this uh, transcriptomic uh, clock measure. And we found that you know, liver regeneration indeed um, you know, reduces the epigenetic age based on this transcriptomic clock. So with that, um, I hope uh, you know, uh, I've discussed uh, uh, a little bit about epigenetic alterations, uh, which is an important hallmark of aging. Um, K27 trimethylation um, um, is a repressive histone modification that accumulates with age. We uh, also saw loss of this modification at peak regions, which compromises cell identity. 
while the gain of K27 over megabase size domains heterochromatinizes the old genome. And then finally, that liver regeneration can partially rejuvenate the epigenome. And with that, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, a lot of people, but especially uh, the trainees in my lab who've, uh, you know, really worked hard over the last few years. Uh, this work is mostly uh, by Na Yang, but also helped by um, everyone. James did uh, some of the bioinformatics uh, uh, in this uh, paper. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, great job, Payal. Um, that's a wonderful talk. Um, uh, I see Zhijian has his uh, hand up. Do do you wanna do you wanna unmute? Now, Payal, this is a really excellent talk, and very happy to see all this exciting progress from your lab. Uh, so, at the 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 gain of K twenty seven over the last and the loss of K nine trimethyl really amazed me. Um, so what, what's going on there in, in those labs that, that again, K27 trimethyl, but lose the, the K9? So are those labs, are still real labs? Are they still repressive? What do you think is, is happening there? Yeah, so, so, so that's exactly what, I mean, we don't know, obviously, but um, that's what we want to explore more biochemically in the future. So, you know, the this uh, mutual exclusivity between K9 and K27 methylation has been kind of reported a little bit in other systems, but the exact reason is unknown. So perhaps, you know, um, you know, EZH2 binding and SUBAR39 binding is somehow, you know, uh, it's not able to happen um, together. So, you know, uh, having one modification repels Maybe having K9 repels EZH2 or PRC2 complex and having PRC2 repels SUVAR39. So we don't know, um, but we do want to, yeah, uh, look at it in the near future. How do you lose EZH2? Is it RNA or protein? Have you checked the RNA? So we've checked the RNA. It trends. To trends to kind of be downregulated, but it's mostly at the protein level. So we haven't, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's autophagy or not, but uh, let's look, look, look at a nuclear autophagy together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's mostly at the protein level, but I have to say, ZH2 is a very strong um, cell cycle related uh, gene. So I, I would imagine that it would go down um, just like lamin B1. The, at the mRNA level. Thank you. Payal, there's a, there's, a, so there's a bunch of questions coming through, not surprisingly, about, you know, the, the, the rejuvenation caused by, associated with, with the re regeneration. Um, so, you know, one comment just from an, an anonymous attendee that, you know, this is, this is fascinating, and, and I agree, I've, I've said that to you before, I think it's really interesting. Uh, Ramin Sadri has a, a, a specific question, which I was also wondering, and we might discuss more in the, the group discussion. But um, you know, is the, you probably haven't done this, okay? But I guess as a thought experiment, do you think that uh, regeneration would promote rejuvenation of a tissue that has a, a high rate of cell division, or is it just, or is it something which is? Is perhaps you know occurs preferentially in, in tissues that are predominantly quiescent or with with slow rates of, of division. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Right. Um, so so I think that this is likely to affect mostly quiescent tissues because, for example, let's say hematopoietic stem cells are you know proliferative, even though uh, their proliferation rate. Uh, you know, slows down with aging. And in fact, EZH1 goes up with yeah. aging in those cells. Um, but I think the effect would be more dramatic for, you know, uh, uh, organs, more quiescent uh, organs. Right. And, and I, I guess in general, we, you know, this, it kind of highlights an important point that we don't necessarily think enough about the differences in, in, epigenetic mechanisms of aging in proliferative versus non-proliferative slowly dividing cells and tissues and there's likely to be you know really fundamental distinctions there correct yeah right 
Um, so uh, Hassan Hijazi uh, wants to know whether you've looked at uh, uh, histone variants associated with you know live, liver aging or 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 regeneration. So not uh, we haven't really looked at you know, like in a very comprehensive manner, but from our mass spec studies, for example, we see that H3.3 uh, goes up with aging, okay. uh, in the aged liver. And as you probably saw from, if you remember from the volcano plot, the K27 trimethylation is actually on H3.3. So, uh, so, so that's one variant that definitely goes up with aging. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there are others, and I think our collaborator Yamini uh, Dalal from NCI is is interested in this. Okay, uh, okay, that's very interesting. Um, Og Ognian has a has a question. Has his hand up? Do you want to unmute Ognian? Uh, yes. Um, I thank you for the talk. It's really fascinating. Um, I was thinking about um, your um, analysis on the liver rejuvenation. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to understand that you looked at uh, epigenetic markers and transcriptomic age right after the liver has uh, recovered, right after regeneration. And I suppose it makes sense that it would appear younger because it has just regenerated, recreated itself. So obviously it has to turn on a number of genes that are related to development and growth. Uh, I was wondering if you have looked or if you're planning to look at what happens then after time, uh, because it could go either way. It, this could be real rejuvenation. So from that point, it would just slowly, slowly uh, age over time like it used to. But it could also be that as soon as it has done rejuvenating, it would relatively quickly go back to its state of um, quiescence. Uh, so I was wondering if you've looked or if you're planning and what are your expectations? What do you think might be the case? Right, I mean, uh, I mean, we would be interested to look, so maybe we could, you know, these livers were harvested about 10 days post regeneration. So we could look at a later time point, you know, maybe one month or two months later, and then compare it to uh, what the original old was, then old 10 days, and then old two months. Um, so, you know, the reason why I think K27 accumulates with age is because it's a very slowly accumulating modification uh, in, the, in the post mitotic stage. So if we have sort of broken the quiescence, we kind of have reset it. And then again, it takes that much amount of time to maybe get back to that you know, high level that was seen in the original old liver. So I'm I'm guessing that, you know, even let's say two months um, post regeneration, it would, should still be younger than the original old liver. But of course, I think we need to do some, you know, clock measures to really uh, see if that's true. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll just ask one more question from the, the Q&A. There's a, there's a lot more which you can take a look at, but um, interesting one from Marta Kovacheva uh, says uh, very beautiful work, um, but you know wants to know more about is is the uh, is the rejuvenation associated with any change in in cell type composition, perhaps to perhaps a more youthful phenotype, and perhaps to be maybe a little bit more specific about that, does does it is it associated with any real you know functional benefits okay so for example decreased immune infiltration inflammation fibrosis steatosis those kinds of things which characterize the the aged liver yeah i mean that's uh, that, that's an obvious next step and un unfortunately you know we haven't done a very uh, good job of functionally characterizing uh, you know the regenerated liver but we are planning to perhaps establish a collaboration with, uh, I think, David Lecouture Le in uh, Australia. He, he looks at these sinusoid, uh, you know, features. Um, and, um, you know, we want to look really at the ultrastructure of the liver to see. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, okay. I mean, one hallmark of, of aged liver in the mouse is that on a high fat diet, it becomes very much more steatotic. So that, that would be a relatively 
easy thing to to assay I think yes yes we've we've, we've done those assays so we could you know let you know how we've been doing those but it's well published right and also some uh, several metabolic parameters I think yeah we discussed this before okay yeah okay great wonderful talk Pyle thanks uh we should uh we should go on we're we're running over um so the uh the next uh speaker is uh Nathan Labraza from uh Mayo Clinic in Rochester and uh, Nathan's going to talk about targeting senescent cells for, for healthy aging. Thanks very much, Nathan. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to much, so much to you and Gary and Mason, Mason for uh, hosting this meeting. Um, I have to admit, I, I'm more of a fan than a contributor. Um, this is not the domain that I typically work in, and I'll do my best to um, make a comment about our interest in the epigenetic space or our fascination with this space, but my talk will largely be centered on this area of senescence and, and really a, an effort amongst uh, many different institutions to come up with strategies to target these cells to improve uh, healthy aging and longevity uh, in line with the theme of this symposium. So um, I'll, I'll quickly disclose, um, we do have some intellectual property uh, relevant to the work that I'll share licensed to uh, commercial entities. And I should also disclose that I don't pretend to have any expertise in the epigenetic realm. So um, I want to be upfront about that. Uh, quickly, uh, a shout out to the team members that have been really major contributors to the work that I'll share today. Those individuals are pictured and I'll try to call them out as I go through the slides. And then on the bottom left of the screen are other members of my lab that help, help support these initiatives. And um, as, as many of you know, um, many of us at Mayo Clinic have a strong interest in the space of senescence, including my collaborators, Joao Passos and Sandeep Kosla, who have been major contributors to the work that I'll share. Um, and others that are listed, as well as Jim Kirkland and Tamara Chaconia, um, who I, I neglected to add to the screen. So I, I'm really excited about the overarching theme of this session of the meeting, and that's really this idea of intervening on aging to transform human health. And without question, this concept have ra has radically transformed to science fiction to science now. And of course, many of us are, are kind of, I think, in awe of the headline grabbing um, uh, news and, and scientific discoveries that have been dominating even the lay press. And that's because I think we've moved from the stage of better understanding the fundamental biology of aging. And of course, there are a number of discoveries to still make in this space in advance, but we're at this new era of asking the question of, can we intervene? And whether you're interested in fundamental markers of DNA damage that I've listed on the left, or the more recent insights into misinformation coming from that DNA because of epigenetic alterations, the opportunities for partial reprogramming, or more recently, this idea of stalled, um, stalled transcription, the notion that we can intervene to have an impact on human health, as we know it, is really quite exciting. And the notion, of course, is not to just make better blood pressure medications or better insulin sensitizers or, or bone building drugs, but the idea is if we can intervene on this fundamental biology to delay the onset of these diseases as a group. And of course, this is the concept that many people are now familiar with, with across many fields, not just aging, that we could extend human health span and and really the impact on society would be compressing morbidity and extending quality of life. So, so this is a big excitement. And of course, um, we've heard a lot about epigenetic alterations and different strategies to maybe modify that landscape. But what I'll talk to you about today are some of the kind of trials and tribulations and the successes that we've had in targeting this other area of biology of cellular senescence. And I should emphasize that as much as we like to put these different forms of damage or misinformation or stalled replication into different buckets, Clearly, when you impact one, you impact the others, both positively and negatively. And there probably is some degree of a unifying uh, hypothesis that we could pursue here. And certainly, um, those interactions provide uh, ripe grounds for uh, interactions between our teams. So um, I'm not going to spend much time on talking about the fundamental biology of senescence. I think, uh, much like Dr. Sen said about epigenetics, it's diverse, it's complex. Um, the phenotype and characteristics of one senescent cell may not replicate another senescent cell from a different tissue or origin, but we certainly agree on some core properties of senescence that I'll highlight throughout the talk today. Increased expression of some of these cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, alterations um, in DNA damage or telomere-associated um, foci, increased expression of, of um, the senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. It's kind of fascinating to think that these cells are damaged to an extent that doesn't cause death, but um, they actually turn on pro-survival machinery to stick around and avoid apoptosis. Uh, and a number of other characteristics that I have um, highlighted in this diagram 
And I'm really showing this to, to emphasize the point that over the years, since the kind of fundamental discovery is that targeting senescent cells can impact different parameters of health, there has been a laundry list of studies looking at how senescence influences the health of a number of different organ systems. And I would argue that those different studies in mouse models highly replicate that slide I showed prior that showed our concerns in human health about diseases across a number of different physiological systems. And it's really quite impressive to me that the idea that targeting this one cell type can have market effects on, uh, on osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, uh, the manifestations of a, a metabolic dysfunction or diabetes, uh, fibrosis and dysfunction of the lungs, alterations in kidney health and function, um, plaque formation in our vasculature, um, the development of plaques and tangles in our brain, uh, and the impact that, that those senescent cells not have just on driving damage, but really um, squelching um, uh, the regenerative potential of different tissues. So it's a bit of this twofer approach of when we look at how these cells contribute to disease and damage, it's not the damage they're causing, but they're certainly creating a toxic environment where regeneration is, is severely compromised. And of course, more recently in light of COVID, um, a strong interest in how senescent cells may be amplifying some of the uh, set of um, uh, cytotoxic storms that occur in the context of, of these different types of infections. And, and really the exciting part about this is we started early on with uh, different genetic approaches to target P16 expressing cells or more recently P21 expressing cells, but that quickly evolved into looking for different ways of pharmacologically targeting these different cell populations. And, and admittedly, um, we're very, very early in um, this space. Uh, I think we have a number of interesting proof of concept molecules, but we have yet to have really large engagement with, with pharma to start looking at large um, uh, drug screening libraries where we can look at different strategies to more specifically and effectively target these cells in a safe fashion, um, and then go from there to hit to lead optimization and, and, and really have um, better drugs. And kind of as I walk through my, my story today, um, I want to emphasize this point of, about really the heterogeneity of senescent cells, and, and I'll use one tissue to kind of highlight that point and, and how we may need to step back and think critically about whether one senes a drug that targets um, senescent cells, either by killing them, which we refer to as senolytics, or changing perhaps their behavior, such as their um, secretome, which would be referred to as senomorphics, um, we may need, to, may need a very different cocktail for one constellation of age-related conditions and another. So just, just keep that in mind. So um, I've been very fortunate to help with some of these projects and lead some of the projects highlighted on the screen uh, at Mayo Clinic and other institutions. But I have to say for the past 10 years, I've been walking around with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because I'm really a skeletal muscle uh, physiologist. And I've been a little bit frustrated by the fact that there really hasn't been much um, published on whether or not senescence is even relevant to skeletal muscle, a tissue that's largely regarded as predominantly a post-mitotic tissue. And other than a story from uh, Pira uh, Canoves um, showing that, you know, satellite cells may express a little bit of P16, that if you tinker with that, you can improve muscle regeneration. There really hasn't been to date a thorough or a, um, methodical examination of skeletal muscle and its susceptibility to this age-related uh, form of damage. And importantly, I'll just highlight that as much as we think about muscle as being this post-mitotic tissue of these huge myofibers with multiple nuclei, 50% of the nuclei in muscle are actually from these other mononuclear cell populations that may have more uh, susceptibility to senescence. And we recently looked at the literature to kind of collect different information on what is known about senescence in skeletal muscle. And, and really, um, there is hints of, of, of senescence at a bulk level in muscle, but when you start to look at the individual contributing cell populations that may be prone to senesce, there's very little known. And this is just kind of a, a, a 30,000 foot view of the literature and the level of evidence that we have for senescence features in these cell populations. And one of the challenges that our field has faced is clearly the fact that there's not a standalone marker of a senescent cell, right? So we've tried to use this kind of comprehensive list of, of core properties of senescence that include factors such as what is inducing senescence, is it a form of DNA damage, metabolic stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, telomere uh, related damage, or what it might be, as well as the cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors, which have really dominated the field as kind of readouts of, of senescence. Um, the, the, the presence or absence of a secretory phenotype, and then of course, a number of different cell type markers, which um, I'll share with uh, different forms of damage and dysfunction within organelles that I'll share as I go through the talk. And clearly, um, I, I hope I don't have to make too hard of a sell of why muscle matters, but clearly it's an important 
um, organ for maintaining our health and independence into light, late life. Um, there's just a discussion about metabolism and muscle is of course the largest metabolic organ in our body that directs our resting metabolic rate, stores all of our glucose and, and does a bunch of other important things. And of course, in this concept of frailty as we age, muscle is clearly a key organ for that. So, so that's why we've been so excited about it um, in our scientific career. So let me just start by telling you a story um, that was recently published um, and led by a postdoc in my lab, Xu Zhang, and, and he really kind of used um, the mouse as a system to investigate senescence in skeletal muscle. And I'll just note that muscle aging is a relatively late event in mice. Um, so we look at mice that are at least 24 months of age to study this phenomenon. And much like humans, mice gain weight as they get older. Uh, and despite the fact that they're gaining weight, they lose lean mass um, and, and muscle weight. And this is just kind of a, a global overview of what muscle aging looks like, or, or some people refer to it as sarcopenia. And when we look at a number of different muscles in the mouse, whether these kind of fast uh, oxidative glycolytic muscles, such as the, the EDL that are important for force production and rapid movement or slow oxidative muscles that are important for more endurance type activities. We can see features of senescence such as high signals for P16 and P21 across different muscle groups, uh, both in male and female mice. And on the right-hand side is just a poor man's heat map using Q QPCR to show some differential expression in the muscles of old mice compared to young mice, suggesting that there's a theme for for senescence occurring in this tissue. And, and really we partnered with Joao Passos team to look at more kind of defining features or complementary features of senescence in skeletal muscle. And, and really these are beautiful images to show that some of the markers that Joao really likes such as telomere associated foci are highly enriched in the muscle of old animals at a bulk tissue level. We see alterations in centromere length and the loss of lamin B1 and HMGB1 from the nuclear envelope. So we see these kind of changes in core properties of senescence that have been used to define senescence in other tissues uh, throughout mammals. And while this is all fine and good, um, we were really interested in, well, what is the source of these signals in a, in a tissue with multiple different cell types? So to start, we use single cell sequencing. And admittedly, um, that's a somewhat of a re restricted view of the landscape of muscle because these large multinucleated myofibers aren't selected, right, for, for putting into droplets and sequencing. It, and, and just the kind of the processing of muscle does yield some myonuclei because some of the cells can rupture, but, but really the focus here is on the mononuclear cell populations. And, and those are kind of uh, detailed uh, in the middle panel with about 10 different cell types that we, we uh, extract in the single cell sequencing approach. Um, and on the bottom, we see some uh, age-related changes that are consistent with what we know in the literature or through different staining techniques where there's maybe a loss of capillary density with muscle, a, a shift in the satellite cell abundance and an increase in pro-inflammatory macrophages. But what really stuck out to us was, were two things. One is that um, somewhat unexpectedly, it's these uh, mesenchymal fibroadipogenic progenitor cells that um, demonstrate the highest abundance of a P16 signal, which is enriched in old animals compared to young animals. And the second element is that what we can more readily detect in aging skeletal muscle tissue in humans and in mice is a P21 signal, but none of the mononuclear cell populations were exhibiting any shift in P21 abundance uh, in, in the mononuclear cells in the old mice. So we were quite interested in the fact that there seems to be this P distinct P16 signal coming from these fibroidogenic progenitor cells, and we can talk more about those in a bit. When we look at that cluster of FAP cells, uh, we see that they divide into three kind of, or four, excuse me, unique clusters. And it's that third purple cluster on the screen that has this high P16 signal. And when we look at this high P16 signal is accompanied by other features of senescence, such as uh, increased um, uh, enrichment, I should say, for, for different cytokines and chemokines and matrix remodeling proteins that we associated with the SAS. And on the right-hand side of the screen, when we look at what pathways are enriched in that cluster of P16 positive FAPs, there are many signals and cues consistent with um, a senescence program. And as I go through the talk and we use these different strategies for gene set enrichment, you'll keep seeing some features such as chemokine signaling pathways, cytokine cytokine receptor interactions, toll-like receptor signaling pathways emerging um, in senescent, what we, we think are senescent cell populations. And of course, when you enrich for those pathways um, and look at uh, how they differ between that cluster three of P16 positive FAPs and, and the, the P16 negative FAPs, um, you can see it's highly enriched um, for chemokine signaling um, in that cell population that we think is senescent. 
So as much as we um, were really excited about the single cell seq data, we thought we should take an orthogonal approach to show that it's truly the FAPs that are emitting this uh, signal that we're detecting in terms of P16. So we did a sorting techniques um, using MAX. And that middle panel shows how with that MAX technique, we could nicely isolate the CD31 and CD68 positive endothelial cells and immune cells using PAC7 to isolate the satellite cells, uh, using PGFR alpha to isolate, isolate these unique FAPs. And you can see that we, we nicely separated these cell populations based on the first four um, graphs. But when you look at that P16 signal, again, it's the, it's the FAPs of the aged mice that really have this enriched P16 signal. Uh, a little bit of a bump in, in, in the endothelial immune cell populations and a little bit of a bump in the satellite cells, but clearly um, it's these FAPs that are, are harboring most of this signal. And then again, working with Joao's team and, and isolating these FAPs, um, to look at other complementary markers of senescence, we once again see that these FAPs themselves are enriched in aged animals with, with uh, gamma H2AX um, within the telomeres, um, uh, an increased length of, of the centromeres, and then the nuclear loss of lambda D1 once again. So really consistent and, and somewhat comprehensive uh, features of senescence in this cell population. So um, what's, what's not in that story is, is, is kind of our kind of deep dive or our interest in better understanding uh, what these senescent FAPs may do. And, and we're talking about a pretty small percentage, if even a, an entire percentage of, of the cells within a tissue and, and clearly, one of the most fascinating elements to senescence to me is the senescence associated secretory phenotype. And there's this very clever tool that came out while we were doing this work called cell chat. And that allows you to use single cell uh, uh, RNA sequencing data to look at different communication patterns in the cells um, within your um, analyses. And what I'm showing you here is kind of what popped out to us. And that's this kind of cool um, autocrine and paracrine signaling that occurs between senescent FAPs and macrophages and non-senescent FAPs and macrophages and the FAPs um, between themselves. And this is a busy slide, but let me just show you a couple of things here that I think are really cool and underappreciated in our field. One is that when we look at the outgoing signals from non-senescent FAPs, they're quite abundant and consistent with the cell type that we're studying, right? So we see high signals leaving um, uh, healthy FAPs, such as you know fibroblast fibroblast growth factor, BMP signals, IGF, um, those are very abundant. But what's interesting is when we think about senescence, we often think that these cells take on this very robust secretory phenotype, which is true, but what we don't talk about is what they're no longer secreting. And I think this is an overlooked area of biology that is, is fascinating and better understanding how senescence is not only contributing to a, a toxic milieu, but it, these cells are no longer contributing key elements to maintain tissue homeostasis. So I wanna point that out. At the same time, the senescent FAPs are acquiring signals that are not present in their healthy counterparts. So here I've, I've highlighted tweak in SPP1, and I'll come back to a couple of these in the next slide. The incoming communication patterns highlight how um, these non-senescent FAPs, we think, um, are, are con conducting a lot of autocrine signaling. So the incoming communication patterns that are outgoing from the non-senescent FAPs, they are receiving themselves. So there's some signaling the macrophages. But what we see in a couple examples, such as SPP1 again, is, is a robust signal here. And the main recipient of that signal is, is in the macrophages. So we've been interested more and more in how senescents are communicating with macrophages and potentially causing some changes in tissue composition. And to that point, I'll just show you one example here of an experiment where as we try to understand how these senescent cells are changing the health of skeletal muscle, uh, these cells are known to differentiate into adipocytes. They're known to contribute to fibrosis. They play a critical role in muscle regeneration. They may be influencing um, muscle atrophy, but we asked a question about whether they're influencing kind of the inflammatory state of an aged tissue. So when we induce senescence um, in these cells, primary cells in vitro, we look at their secretome by measuring the content of these different proteins in their media. And this is kind of a select list that we've developed as biomarkers of senescence. And in the media of senescent cells, you can see really just really remarkable enrichment of these proteins um, across the board. Some of them are growth factors, some of those are cytokines and chemokines, and some of those are different matrix remodeling proteins. And you can see these are increased whether we uh, induce senescence with etoposide, a DNA damaging agent, or with irradiation. And when we do a mac macrophage migration assay, we can see this milieu of these senescent FAPs is clearly driving an increase in macrophage migration compared to the control media. 
And when we look at a couple of the factors that are uniquely enriched in these senescent fats compared to these non-senescent fats, when we add an antibody to that um, media, we can abrogate um, the migration of these macrophages in this assay. And, and this isn't to suggest that um, um, antibodies to osteopontin and CCL2 are the only ones that are active. We haven't done an exhaustive search, but it, it's kind of interesting to see that what we learned through a bioinformatics analysis seems to play out um, in, in a, an actual uh, in vitro assay. So now I'm going to start sweating because this is the only any type of uh, epigenetic story that I have or chromatin story that I have for this talk. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Sarah Jackham, who's a PhD student in my lab, who's been doing this work. She came to me with a very kind of out there idea, um, the notion that shift workers um, have accelerated aging. So maybe there's an interplay between senescence um, and circadian rhythms. And, and she's shown through a number of different assays. This is just one flavor on the far left of how there is this kind of increased amplitude and phase of senescence, or I'm sorry, circadian uh, clock genes or regulators um, in, in um, these are fibroblasts in this case. And, and there's a, this shift in amplitude and phase is really quite interesting. And, and we see this high, high level of BMOL, which is coded by um, ARNT1 here. Um, and when we do a, a chip seek assay with BMOL, we see differential binding. And we're just in the point now of, of looking at uh, the, the interaction of, of this BMOL chip seek, which clearly has different binding motifs in a senescent cell versus a non-senescent cell. And as a pioneer transcription factor, it's interesting then to integrate that with the RNA sequencing data from those cells. And we're starting to get some insights into potentially how um, BMOL may interplay with, with uh, a senescent cell and, and regulate uh, gene expression. And we think this is maybe um, uh, a key player in, in regulating the SASP. And, and um, on the right-hand side of the screen is, is somewhat unrelated, but we actually have this data in, in BMOL knockout um, cells as well. And you can just see Clearly, there are, there are clusters of genes that are very differentially regulated between a uh, senescent cell that, that has BMOL intact and a senescent cell that does not. And this will help feed back into understanding how uh, this interesting biology is, is interacting. And um, I'll be reaching out to many of you to help us <laughs> walk through these analyses and, and do complementary um, studies. So I've given you kind of a quick pitch on this interesting uh, story about P16 positive uh, fibroid epigenic progenitor cells. But, but, but where is this P21 signal coming from? And I, I've shown you that at a tissue level, we see high P21, but when we look at the mononuclear cells, either at the single cell RNA sequencing data or through the, the max sorting and look at the mononuclear cell populations, there's no evidence of an increased P21 signal coming from those cells. In addition, if we do, you know, just look at a Western blot for P21 in whole skeletal muscle, we see high enrichment. And then if we do RNA-ish staining, we see more fibers in the um, aged animals stain positively for P21. And, and, and in particular, we see um, many more fibers with several, several puncta of P21 in the aged animal. So with these kind of preliminary data, uh, my postdoc Xu Zhang then went through the effort of teasing out 180 mature myofibers from an old muscle and 180 mature fibers from young muscles. Uh, so, so multiple animals contributed to this cell population. And what you can see on the bottom right here, that the majority of myofibers in an old mouse have the same amount of P21 as you see in a young mouse. This is a pretty abundant transcript. But there is a subset of these fibers that have incredibly high P21 levels. This is about somewhere in the five to eight percentile range of all the fibers that we collected. When we look at the staining, it's kind of a similar number that we see having many puncte um, um, uh, for the P21 signal in a tissue cross-section. So we thought this was quite interesting. So what Chu did then is once he measured P21 using qPCR on these fibers, he then submitted young fibers, old P21 low fibers uh, that had the same P21 abundance as the young fibers, and old P21 high fibers for sequencing. And what you can see here is really a dramatic difference in the transcriptional profile of the old P21 high fibers compared to either the old P21 low fibers or the young fibers. Meanwhile, the young fibers and the old P21 low fibers, even though they're only differentiated by, based on this one factor, are really quite similar, which is, it was, was really fascinating to us. 
When we look at the enrichment and the different pathways in those old P21 high fibers, again, a lot of the same factors that we saw in the FAPS emerge, such as increased cytokine, cytokine receptor interaction pathways, jack stat signaling, of course, P53 signaling consistent with um, the isolation of the, using P21 to isolate these fibers. Um, and, and again, signals to us that despite the fact these are post-mitotic cells have many features or characteristics of senescence. Um, and some of the genes contributing to these pathways are highlighted on the right-hand side of the screen in the heat map. So um, we were really quite interested in whether or not um, to understand the significance of, of, of P21. So we, we asked kind of a, a real simple question of whether or not P21 is sufficient to drive features of skeletal muscle aging. And, and we were fortunate um, to do a proof of concept experiment because Jan van Dursen had generated a mouse that had P21 overexpression, uh, also with the reporter tomato um, built in. And you can see across um, all tissues, um, high tomato expression. Um, in, in both the control animals and, the, and the, the animals with both tomato and P21 overexpression. And throughout organ systems, you see um, effective induction of P21. And interestingly, this story really hasn't been told yet, but these animals have a lifespan of three or four months. They have uh, features of aging, such as kyphosis, graying of the fur, cataracts, um, and, and, and some other features that really have not yet been carefully characterized. They're somewhat of a difficult line to work with. But, but interestingly, um, when we looked at the muscle of these animals, and again, I'm the first to admit that this is not a conditional model, it's not tissue specific, but even so, the muscle here, again, has many of the pathways upregulated that I mentioned prior. And, and again, suggesting that this kind of transcriptional profile of a, of a mouse with high P21 in the muscle, it nicely reflects what we're observing in a chronologically aged mouse, makes this an interesting model to, to look at. And what you can see here is um, a number of um, different markers of senescence and including an increase in uh, gamma H2AX, or markers of DNA damage within the myonuclei of the, the mice overexpressing P21E compared to the, their controls. And in addition to that, we see other features such as mitochondrial dysfunction, which uh, Joao often reminds me is an overlooked feature of senescence, um, but here we see marked reductions in mitochondrial uh, capacity and, and, and function uh, in, the, in the isolated fibers of, of, the, um, of the P21 overexpressing mice. And then when we look at other features um, within the animal, we see uh, a lot of the things that we saw in, in what I showed you in the first slide in terms of what does muscle aging look like. And even though we see reduction in body weight in these animals, this is largely attributed to, to the loss in lean mass. And we look at the weights of the different muscles. Um, we see that uh, there's a reduction in muscle cross-sectional area when we measure um, the diameter of these different fibers within muscle. And there's a loss of um, um, uh, force by these muscles as well. Uh, no change in fiber distribution. And of course, other features of muscle aging include a loss of function. So we see reductions in maximal exercise capacity in a treadmill, and we see a reduction in grip strength. And I didn't have a lot of time to go into it today, but, but we've been quite interested in our human studies at looking, different, at looking at different biomarkers of senescence. And we think components of this ASP are really quite helpful in doing that. And, and we take a lot of flack for um, not be able to demonstrate convincingly in humans that circulating factors that we think are linked to the SAS are only from senescent cells. But here's an example where many of the factors that we're quite interested in, like GDF15 and some of the matrix remodeling proteins, TNFR1, we see high levels of these circulating proteins um, in these animals with high P21 overexpression, you know, providing some level of support that what we're measuring in humans is in fact linked to uh, a senescence program. So we've, we've done quite a bit of work in this biomarker space, and, and this is somewhat of an awkward um, shift into just talking about some of our human studies where we've looked at some of these different biomarkers uh, in the circulation of humans, factors produced by senescent cells, and we've linked these different biomarkers to chronological aging consistent with the premise that senescent cell burden increases with chronological age, and we've linked them to different clinical manifestations of advanced biological age. So we've heard a little bit about frailty today, as well as different adverse outcomes after surgery. So when we look at individuals who have undergone surgery for heart disease or for cancer, we can use these biomarkers to predict those who are gonna have surgical complications or rehospitalization, different uh, important clinical outcomes linked to advanced biological age in humans. Now, we recently published how well these biomarkers do at predicting physical function in older adults. This is a study of about 1300 individuals in the late life um, uh, intervention for uh, independent study uh, based out of Florida. We have a story in review of looking at how these biomarkers link to pulmonary health and function, um, a follow-up study to our work in mice showing how senescence can drive pulmonary fibrosis. 
and clearance of senescent cells can improve uh, pulmonary function. And, and some follow-up studies looking at uh, a number of different health outcomes in humans. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'll just kind of share with you, um, as we think about strategies to improve the health of organs through xenotherapeutic interventions, many of us reach uh, for the shelf for disat them for setin because brilliantly Jim Kirkland's group showed how this can disable the pro-survival networks in many different cell populations. Unfortunately, we don't see DNQ to be particularly effective in muscle itself. And, and I say that carefully because we see no shift when we treat older mice with the statin and quercetin in the P16 or the P21 signal. But even so, we think that the systemic effects and other organ systems of DNQ ultimately translate to improvements in the transcriptional profile of muscle. So this is kind of interesting and there's been some really um, cool work done where you can transplant senescent cells into an animal and even though they don't um, take residence in particular tissues, they can influence the health of other organs through their secretory phenotype, once again, emphasizing the importance of the SASP. So, so we use DQ in this study somewhat to appease reviewers. Um, we, we weren't really crazy about the experiment. We saw a nice shift uh, in the transcriptional profile within muscle, and interestingly, things that we saw upregulated in old animals compared to young were largely reversed um, in, in the old animals treated with DQ, so that was kind of cool, and we saw that um, uh, in, in animals um, treated with DQ, we saw um, a, a relative enrichment of, of the P53 signaling pathway in the, in the vehicle treated animals versus the DQ treated animals, uh, where, where we really saw um, no differences between um, meaningful effect in, in the old versus the young. So I'll just kind of share that um, this is another look at just some of the other analyses that we did in the study and, 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 and really kind of interesting trends, changes in central nucleated fibers and, and a modest improvement in grip strength, but we think these are probably more systemic effects than specific effects on muscle itself. And I'll just share with you that we've been effectively or actively studying um, or looking for different drugs in partnership with Paul Robbins and Dao Hong Zhu um, that may more specifically target the cells in muscle that we'd like to get rid of, in particular the FAPs. And we're a little bit away from looking for drugs for the fibers, but when we screened drugs to target these P16 positive FAPs, we've had a couple of very interesting hits. Uh, Navitaclax, um, which is a BCL family uh, member inhibitor, um, actually shows pretty good efficacy, but its safety profile is pretty atrocious, so we haven't been excited about that. But here I'm just showing you some data from this other drug. We use an incusite system to screen these drugs, and we can look at a dying signal that's emitted from these cells over the course of 48 hours. And what you can see is when we screen these drugs, we can um, see a dose response with this one candidate, um, 753B, where with increasing concentrations, we see increased death in the senescent cell population, but in the control healthy cells, we don't really see meaningful effects, which is important. And that's quantified here on the bottom right. And this is just preliminary data, but we've done a, an early trial in partnership with Dao Hong Zhu um, when he was at Florida, now he's at UT San Antonio. Um, but we really see impressive effects um, uh, on the molecular phenotype of, of muscle and aged mice. This is a six month intervention where the strength was uh, assessed every two months in these animals, but you can see a pretty marked reduction in uh, P16 and P21 consistent with a reduction in the cell populations that we're most interested in. And some other features that I won't comment on today that we think impact um, muscle health and function. Uh, again, we see this interesting reduction in central nucleated fibers, this is maybe less about degeneration and maybe more about kind of innervation of muscle uh, in the context of aging. And we see uh, beneficial effects on grip strength uh, throughout the course of the study. So um, it's really an exciting time in the field as we go from kind of bench to bedside or kind of the male lingo that we use is knowledge, knowledge to delivery. And, and there's certainly no shortage of review articles now talking about kind of changes or advances in this area of, of xenotherapeutic drugs, I would say, not necessarily senolytic. It, it appears that suppressing the SAS can be just as effective or can be more effective in some cases for uh, manifesting improvements in health. Um, but I, I promised to Peter that I wouldn't neglect um, probably um, our, our favorite intervention to promote healthy aging, certainly the most evidence-based intervention that we have. And that's um, exercise where um, we are kind of exercise evangelists and even before our understanding of senescence, um, really it's ability to counter many of the different forms of age-related um, cellular and molecular damage. And um, there, there's some evidence and some of it might be controversial about exercise being able to prevent DNA damage or promote DNA repair, clearly restoring homeomesis to mitochondrial health and function, um, stimulating autophagy and, and, and countering inflammation, there's strong evidence there. 
And then we think about the accumulation of senescent cells with advancing age. We think a lot of that has to do with this unhealthy cellular milieu where immune function is compromised for identifying and deleting uh, those senescent cells from a tissue. And we think exercise may play a role in promoting the clearance of these cells and ultimately having an impact on how many senescent cells we accumulate throughout the life course um, and, and in turn uh, preventing the onset of a host of age-related conditions that I've referenced throughout the talk. And I'll just show you a very simple example. It was almost a study of convenience um, that we uh, were fortunate to work on. We have an active older adults program at our, our, our um, work uh, place. And this was a study of 30 individuals that were 60 uh, years of age or older, relatively healthy, I would say, because they were participating in an active exercise program. So we assessed them before they started the program and afterwards. And in response to this, uh, this program, uh, not surprisingly, we saw improvements in strength, reductions in the time it took to do repeated chair stands, um, doing standard clinical measures of function, such as a timed up and go test. We see improvements there in these individuals. And importantly, uh, of course, patient reported outcomes of fatigue and well being and quality of life also improved in response to this intervention. And we took advantage of Ned Sharpless's assay where he isolates CD3 positive T cells from the circulation as a biomarker of senescence. These cells are enriched for P16, so they're a little bit better um, in terms of signal to noise ratio for, for assessing um, senescence you know, signals, um, if you will. And what you can see here is that uh, we, we saw a pretty consistent reduction in many of the markers of, of not only just P16 signals and P21 signals, but activation of the CGAS sting signaling pathway in these individuals just 12 weeks after they participated in the exercise program. And, and of course, um, I can't claim that um, we reprogrammed the cells, but that's one possibility, or maybe there's kind of rejuvenation of, of these cells. And um, these are a different cell, pop, uh, you know, new cells that are, 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 are we're measuring here in these uh, exercised individuals. But I think it's a cool proof of concept. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of add one more example of a, a lifestyle intervention. We've um, just finished the analysis and we're putting together the story on calorie. So Zaira Aversa, uh, postdoc in my lab has been hard at work on this study where calorie is a very fascinating study. It's the only kind of two year longitudinal study in humans of caloric restriction, about 200 participants randomized two to one, two to caloric restriction for every one person assigned to an ad libitum diet. The goal was 25% reduction over the course of two years. The average is about 12%. So if you think about it, it's not dramatic, right? But it, it's, it's probably a meaningful amount of reduction. Uh, clearly conferred or conveyed many health benefits and cardiovascular risk and metabolic improvements. And um, we've looked at about 30 different biomarkers of senescence and we see about half of them are positively affected, even these younger healthy individuals um, in terms of uh, the circulating abundance of different uh, biomarkers that we're interested in. And, and these are a little bit complicated graphs because they're measures in change, not necessarily abundance, um, but showing a, a significant effect of caloric restriction. On the right-hand side, we took advantage of some data from Deep Dixit, where he had a nice paper doing RNA sequencing on the adipose tissue of individuals who just participated in the um, caloric restriction arm. And you can see when we use this kind of uh, gene set that we recently published for senescence called SenMayo, um, we see uh, relative enrichment at baseline compared to 12 months and baseline compared to 24 months um, in individuals who underwent caloric restriction, suggesting that some of these different um, features of the molecular signature of senescence are benefiting uh, in the adipose tissue of these relatively young uh, middle-aged individuals. So um, a bit of a smorgasbord today in terms of um, my thoughts on uh, senolytics as a strategy to improve healthy aging and longevity. But what I've tried to convey to you is uh, senescence is indeed a hallmark of muscle aging. Importantly, we see very distinct um, signatures of senescence in two very different cell populations in muscle. And there's just a lot of questions that we have surrounding that of, of uh, what, why P16 but not P21 and FAPS and why P21 but not P16 and, and fibers and, and what does this mean and, and how is that regulated? Um, we, we kind of demonstrated in the paper that a proof of concept senolytic cocktail of desatin and quercetin um, had probably meaningful or important effects on muscle, but what we're really excited about is more targeted therapies um, that exhibit superiority, at least in preclinical testing. Um, I didn't show you the data, but we had another kind of figure in the story about, um, we, we did biopsies on 30 young and 30 older individuals um, and showed that many of those same enriched pathways that we showed you in the myofibers and the FAPs are evident in the bulk tissue of older humans, such as cytokine, cytokine receptor signaling pathways um, that are consistent with kind of the senescence and pro-inflammatory state. And then importantly, um, as much as we're all kind of in the search of these new drugs to target these cells, 
without question, we, we have a very scalable and readily implementable uh, number of solutions that are lifestyle factors that we think um, clearly have an influence on senescent cell burden and SASP. So as we move forward, we're working hard on understanding the mechanistic understanding of senescence and muscle aging, as well as in other systems, um, and very interested at, in, in, in how these senescent cells within a given tissue are influencing the health of the surrounding cell populations. Um, and of course, um, through a number of different efforts and collaborations, we're trying to advance the current battery of drugs that we have available to target these cells. So um, I'll finish by thanking you for your attention. Uh, it's great to be here. I've really learned a lot and enjoyed uh, the discussions and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, wonderful talk, Nathan. That's really, uh, really beautiful stuff. Um, so um, we, are, we are running quite a bit behind, but we, we, we'll get some questions in. There's, there's a um, question from Ramin Sadri in, in, in the chat, which um, he raises you know, the, the very interesting point of uh, reactive oxygen species, which I think is very interesting when we're thinking about senescence in the muscle, because obviously, you know, on the one hand, Ross is thought to uh, promote senescence, uh, may also also has some beneficial functions, and ROS is also produced during exercise, which is something that you've shown is is beneficial. So, so what do you think is the, the role and, and the interplay of you know ROS in senescence and ROS produced by by exercise in um, in, in in the muscle? Yeah, I, I think you already hinted at it, Peter, and it's it's really a story of hormesis, and you know we're all a little bit guilty. It's human nature to think, well, if, if too much of something is bad for you, I don't want any of it. And it's been clearly shown that if you get rid of oxidative stress with exercise, you lose its beneficial effects on other organs. So it, it's clearly this story of hormesis. Um, I think part of this P twenty one overexpression story is clearly driving some mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress that's inducing the spread of senescence and more DNA damage. So. Is, is keeping it in check. And I think, you know, yes, exercise drives reactive oxygen species, but it also markedly upregulates upregulate, the antioxidants. So um, Im important to have those in combination. Okay. And, and I think there is just, just to note, particularly for this audience, there's effect, you know, that I think there have been, there's, there's effects of ROS on the epigenome as well. So, so I, I, you know, to what extent ROS can be detrimental versus hormetic on, on the epigenome is something interesting to think about. Um, Vera has her hand up. Do you want to go ahead, Vera? Uh, yes, and great talk, Nathan. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, um, but maybe you said that. What do you think? What is the driver of this senescence? It, it, does it have anything to do with telomeres or is it so raw and like stress? Yeah, I mean, the most consistent signals that we see, and again, this is just from kind of transcriptional profiling, it, it seems like DNA damage is the, the consistent theme. Um, I would really like to think of more sophisticated ways to measure that. You know, we're a little bit guilty of doing gamma H2AX, and um, we love partnering with Joao and doing the, the telomere associated foci, but, but I think that's really a fundamental question that um, we definitely need help on how to tackle that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Jessica Pru uh, has asked, uh, do you see sex differences um, in the, the uh, of the effects of exercise? Oh, the effects of exercise. That's a good question. Um, I, I was going to ask about senescent cell burden, and I'll tell you that every experiment we change our mind of what sex is more prone to senescence. Um, it just seems to shift a lot. And, and now with some of our biomarkers, we're seeing some sex differences. We don't know how meaningful they are. Uh, and then with exercise, I, I don't think so. I, I think we've seen pretty universal responses. Um, interestingly, this is a total, not answering your question, but for exercise studies, we get better participation amongst older women than older men. Um, so that also influences uh, <laughs> our, our, our interpretation of the data. Okay, okay. Um, I had a, I just have, I'll just take the last question before we, before we move on. Um, I mean, something that you you noted, which was I thought really interesting, was the the loss of expression of some factors such as FGF in in um, I'm not sure whether it was the the I think it was it was the senescent FAP. So so what, what do you I mean? You know, we've all been for many years. You know, we're all very focused upon the SASP, but to what ex to how important do you think, particularly when we start thinking more about senescence in a in a cell and tissue specific 
context, you know, not just fibroblasts in culture. How important is, is going to be the, the loss of expression and loss of identity of, of specific cell types when they become senescent? Yeah, I, I think this is a real important feature for uh, tissue homeostasis. And I think it's going to be very obviously cell type specific, but even, and I, I probably shouldn't say this, and because I think it's such a cool story, but even when we look at these P21 high myofibers, some of the myokines or exerkines that you hear about, we mm -hmm. see lost in those, those cells. And that's probably important for the local tissue microenvironment. But then we also know that through things like exercise, right? How is exercise influencing brain health? And, and, and there are some factors that are known to be released from muscle that, that mediate those effects. And it's possible that in the context of senescence, you're losing that. Um, so I, I think it's a really interesting area. I, I'm just trying to think of an acronym to describe it. It's like the uh, <laughs> the loss of a SASP. I don't know, last. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess uh, SENNET will hopefully shed some a lot of light on this in you know tissue specific contexts, loss of identity associated with cell senescence. That'd be yep. interesting. Okay, we? Um, we should uh, we should move on. So um, you know the last talk of the the session uh last but but definitely not not least is 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 morgan levine um and um from now from uh i think from solely from altos labs is that right now morgan or uh, you, I, you, I still have an affiliation with you okay so uh, uh yale university and and a, a founding member of of Al altos labs in, in in san diego so a great addition to the to the san diego research community and Morgan's going to talk about DNA methylation landscapes in aging and, and reprogramming. Uh, so thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for Active Motif. I actually wore my Active Motif shirt today in honor of this conference. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, you guys have heard already a lot about epigenetic clocks. I think they've been in at least four of the other talks. Um, I'm going to talk about them, but really in the context of how we should think about them and how sh we should think about Kind of using them as biomarkers of aging and what a change in the epigenetic clock might actually represent. Um, so first, just this idea of biological aging. So epigenetic clocks or any of these other biomarkers were really developed with this idea of trying to quantify the, the biological aging process in contrast to the chronological aging process. Um, but one consideration or perhaps even issue with this is the concept of biological aging is actually this, it's this latent feature. There's no ground truth and there's no actual observable biological age that a given organism has. And it's actually just this really complex multidimensional process. You can think of it almost akin to intelligence. There's no actual concrete way to measure it. And instead, we actually have to use different mathematical models to kind of approximate this in an abstract way. So similar to how this abstract painting gives you the idea that it's a picture of a face without directly being a face, this is kind of how we think about biological aging. Can we create something that's in the image of biological aging without the ability to actually measure it directly? So there we go. Uh, so epigenetic clocks are probably some of the most famous biomarkers of aging. And just quick background, even though people already covered this, is that they're based on DNA methylation. So this is methylation at these CPG dinucleotides, and there's 28 million of these throughout the human genome. However, most clocks comprise only about 100 to maybe a few thousand of these CPGs. And most of the epigenetic clocks were developed using something called supervised machine learning. So that's where you take some variable, typically this was chronological age, and then you take your DNA methylation data and you try to predict chronological age, or even the second generation clocks, things that we think are better indicators of biological age. Morgan, can I interrupt for a moment? It looks yes. like your slides are only showing like the upper left corner. Oh, there's, okay. They're zoomed really far in. Yeah. Is that still weird? Yeah. Can you see them when they're like this? Yes, they look full screen there. That's I don't know. Weird. They zoom all the way in. Um, hold on, let me try one more time. I don't wanna to take too much time. I can do it in this screen if it's not.
Is that still zoomed in? Yeah, same problem I'm seeing. I'm not sure why. Uh, that too? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go from here so as not to take time. It's probably not that big. Yeah, it should be problem. fine unless you have a lot of that. You won't, we won't get the animations here. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll lose some of the animation, but I think the gist of it will come across. Okay. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Yep. Um, so these epigenetic clocks have been developed for about the past decade. And in many ways, they're actually pretty decent biomarkers of aging. So they uh, correlate with chronological age, as shown here on the left side. Uh, you can also take the residual, so kind of the difference between the predicted age and what you would expect for someone's chronological age. And we see that people who are predicted older tend to have increased risks of things like morbidity and mortality. So here it's showing survival probability for the bottom core trial, so who we think of the slowest agers versus the fastest agers. Um, interestingly, these same epigenetic clocks also seem to work in vitro, so you can basically grow cells in culture, and you find that as these cells age in culture, you also see an increase in the epigenetic clock, and they seem to be responsive to some interventions, particularly epigenetic reprogramming using Yamanaka factors or, or OSKM. Um, but there's still some things that I think we need to consider when we're trying to think about whether these actually serve as good biomarkers of aging. So again, as I said, they do accomplish some of these things. They track with chronological age, although not perfectly, which we actually want because we want something a biological age that is distinct from chronological age. For the most part, they seem to be fairly good independent predictors of morbidity and mortality. And one thing that we haven't shown yet that the field needs to move towards is showing that changes in the clock also produce functional changes in some aging outcomes. So whether if you were to reduce the clock, would you actually also get a reduction in risk? Um, and then the other issue that we actually need to still accomplish is have some mechanistic understanding of what these epigenetic clocks are actually quantifying. Uh, and then, Another thing that people often forget is this idea of reliability. So if you are to have a biomarker of aging, you want a biomarker that has minimal variation in kind of test, retest scores, and also limited batch effect. Um, so for my talk, what I'll talk, I'll first start with this reliability problem, and then I'll go towards how we're trying to develop some construct validity for epigenetic clocks and actually understand what they're uh, measuring. So this is uh, a paper that was recently published in Nature Aging by Albert Higgins Chen as the first author. And what we asked was if I have technical replicates, so I have basically one blood sample split into two, and I ran these epigenetic clocks on each of these samples, would I get the same answer? And of course, for a biomarker, you would hope that you did get the same answer. Uh, but what we actually found was that for most of the existing epigenetic clocks, we did not get the same answer. So the way to read these figures um, for these histograms on the x-axis is the difference between the two technical replicates. So you can see often you get five years, sometimes even nine years difference between these technical replicates. And so we really thought, oh, maybe this is the end of epigenetic clocks for clinical trials. But uh, in trying to solve this, we were actually able to develop a, a mathematical way to fix this issue where instead of training clocks on individual CPGs, we were <clears throat> essentially training them on kind of higher order, higher dimensional uh, signals. So the embeddings that you'd get from a PCA. And I won't go into the methods of that, but just to show that you can actually reduce the variation drastically between tactical replicates in all of these clocks that we retrained. So why is that important? Uh, so it's important for a number of reasons. So one is if we actually want to longitudinally track people over time, looking at things like interventions. Um, originally with the clocks, you would see people kind of jumping all over the place in terms of their epigenetic age. And you're not sure whether these are true changes in epigenetic aging or representing noise. So what we actually found was when you cleaned up the signal, most of these kind of drastic changes were actually just due to noise, and people actually tended to stay pretty consistent over time. The other thing is if you're going to use these 
at, as um, an endophenotype in a clinical intervention. You actually want something with low noise because it gives you more power to uh, detect effect sizes. So we actually ran power analyses for both two different types of data. So one, if you were to do this in a human uh, uh, clinical trial, or if you were to do high throughput screens in vitro, the difference in sample size that you would need using in gray is the original clocks and in blue are these new PC clocks. And what you can see is re as uh, regardless of kind of the effect size that you expect to get from your intervention, this drastically reduces the number of samples or the number of people you need to enroll in your study. So that kind of gets at this idea of at least if you see a change in the epigenetic clock, we can feel a little bit more confident that it wasn't due to just random noise in these measures. But we still don't know what these changes actually represent. So what is kind of the underlying causality of these epigenetic clocks? And you know, some people have even said, oh, well, it's you know, akin to changing an odometer. You can change kind of this readout of the thing. And are you actually changing the under underlying biology? I actually disagree that it's probably simply an odometer. Uh, but we still do need some data to actually link changes in epigenetic age to changes in function. And we also need work to actually decode epigenetic clocks and what they biologically represent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so one uh, hypothesis that we have in thinking about what epigenetic clocks represent is that they don't actually represent a single thing, but that clocks are actually composites of multiple kind of epigenetic phenomenon that just kind of get captured in the same thing. So one analogy that I want to use actually now being in San Diego and, and really getting to enjoy Mexican cuisine is this idea that uh, so in Mexican food, you source uh, just a few types of local uh, food. So often things like beans, rice, cheese, but you can make kind of this wide array of diverse uh, entrees. And this is kind of how I think of the epigenetic clocks. So they're sourcing a few types of CPGs in terms of kind of regulatory features or what they biologically represent. And they kind of, each clock puts those together in a different way. And having more of one in a, one clock versus another might give you a different signal when you're applying that clock to an intervention or trying to understand mechanism. And really what we need to do is understand, quote, the ingredients that are going into the epigenetic clock. So the unique signals that are going in, what they represent. And then if you were to do an intervention or you were to apply these clocks, look at the distinct pieces along with the overall clock score because you might see a change in the clock score, but it could be due to just one component of the epigenetic clock versus changing all the CPGs across the entire clock. Uh, so the way we went about trying to kind of deconstruct these and understanding uh, the ingredients of these is to do uh, clustering on CPGs. So what we did is we took all the CPGs that have ever been um, included, well, not ever, but in most of the famous epigenetic clocks are about 6,000 of these unique CBGs. And we looked at them in a bunch of different data types. So different uh, tissue samples in vitro and in vivo. And we clustered them based on their patterns. So CBGs that, that change together. So when one increases, the other one also increases, or, or when one decreases, the other decreases. Oh, my animation's not going to work here. Uh-oh. Okay, I'll just do this. <laughs> okay, uh, so the idea is that first you create these affinity matrices for each of these different data types, and then we combine them into a single one, and then each CPG gets assigned to a different cluster. So we're denoting these clusters based on color. Um, and then what we can do is we can actually look at the contributions of each of these individual clusters to the overall clock score. And this is because actually epigenetic clocks are really simple in terms of how you calculate them. They're just linear uh, combinations where every CPG is multiplied by a weight and then you add it across. So what we did is we only summed the parts from each cluster. So we would take the blue cluster and just sum the CPGs in the blue cluster, green, yellow. And then of course, if you sum them all together, you get the full clock score. 
But now we can actually say what part of the state, how much signal is coming from each of these distinct clusters. And again, I have animation that's going to mess this up. Um, I'll just scroll through though. Uh, so first, we just said what are the distributions of these different clusters in the various clocks? Um, and as you can see, they're pretty similar, at least across these four clocks. And there's two bars because uh, first we looked at them in whole blood, and then we also looked at them in iPSCs because the weights could change a little bit based on the tissue or data type you're looking at. Um, but then when we start looking at other unique clocks, which actually have the effect of chronological age completely taken out of them, uh, you see fairly different distributions from what we saw before. So you get enrichment of these kind of CPGs that we assigned to this uh, red cluster and some enrichment of this yellow cluster. We can then look at more what we call bespoke clocks. Uh, so the Jean clock is actually a mortality only clock. And you can see it's really comp uh, compromised just two or composed of just two types of these CPGs. Uh, the hypo clock are these uh, CPGs that tend to be hypermethylated but lose methylation with age in these um, WCGW regions. So they're in very low density CPG regions. And then the opposite is these epitoc clocks, which tend to be these polycomb associated uh, CPGs in um, promoter regions, CPG island promoter regions. And then lastly, we just asked the question now that Steve Horvath uh, with Illumina developed this new mammalian array, are specific clusters conserved or are you missing entire clusters off the mammalian array? And what we found is actually most of these were represented in these conserved CPG regions as well. So one reason to look at the individual modules is in the context of interventions. So if I were to do an intervention and see a change in the clock, again, as I mentioned before, one would ask, is it happening across the entire clock as a whole, or is it really just driven by one type of CPG that's responsive to that intervention? And if it is just one type, you'd want to know what that CPG type actually represents. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about one intervention that people have already mentioned today, which is just uh, this epigenetic reprogramming phenomenon where you can take a somatic cell, let's say a uh, skin fibroblast, and convert it back to what looks like an embryonic stem cell in terms of uh, this induced pluripotent stem cell. So most epigenetic clocks show a reversal of the overall clock score. This is just one clock, but you can show it across almost all of the epigenetic clocks where you have your original cell after you apply OSKM for let's say a month, you get a complete reversion of the epigenetic clock. Um, but we asked again, is this universal? Is this happening across all the different types of CPGs? And what we found is that it's actually not, and it's really driven by just a few of these modules. So these are all the different clocks and their overall scores are split up by the various modules. And you can see, in terms of a change from baseline, which ones are the most responsive to this epigenetic programming phenomenon over the course of these about 28 days. So overall, we find that these kind of uh, green, yellow, green, and light blue ones tend to be the most consistently uh, responsive to this epigenetic reprogramming phenomenon. Uh, the one interesting place was this Dunedin pace of aging clock where this green, yellow one goes up. And what we actually found is that it's reverse coded in that clock. So what's called uh, younger in all the other clocks is actually called older uh, in the Dunedin clock. So then we asked, what do these three different modules actually represent? Uh, and this is a little hand wavy at this point. We haven't confirmed that functionally these are what they represent, but this is what it seems to be. So what we find is that the ones in this light blue module tend to be associated in these uh, CPG islands, which makes sense because they were also enriched in the epitop clocks, which are these PRC2 associated clocks. Uh, the green tend to be in these shore regions, and then this green yellow tends to be in the open seas. Um, we can also look at enrichment um, for binding of either transcription factors or histone modifications. And again, this green one really does seem to be these PRC2 bivalent promoter associated CPGs. 
Um, the green one, we think, is something to do with maybe nucleosome occupied promoters. Um, and then finally, this green yellow one seems to be some intergenic punitive enhancers uh, because we've seen enrichment for things like PP300. So then we looked um, at the behavior of these three specific modules to try and get a better sense of what they actually represent. Uh, what we found is they that three of them are very distinct. So in IPSCs, this green yellow one tends to be CPGs that are very hypermethylated. Uh, the green one tends to sit somewhere in the middle, so actually very heterogeneous in IPSC. So you can think of this as about half your uh, cells are methylated in these regions and half aren't. And then the blue are very hypomethylated. And what we can see is with perhaps differentiation, um, you kind of get this flattening out of these. So the green, this one tends to flatten out. You get more kind of movement towards hypomethylation this one flattens out. And then by the time you have aged, it seems fairly flat um, and not to show consistent signals. So we looked a little bit more at the age correlations but in these three different types of CVGs when you look at the actual clock scores. Um, so this shows these three are in brain and I'm showing this for the pheno age clock because the pheno age clock was actually trained only in whole blood and only in adult samples, but we actually see really interesting uh, patterns in other tissues and in non-adult samples. So this just shows um, kind of the log of age with um, the overall epigenetic score. And actually what this suggests is that most of the changes or actually more rapid changes are actually happening during the developmental time as opposed to during kind of aging in adulthood. And you can see this here where we kind of just restrict to this kind of developmental period versus the age period. This is in blood, um, I mean, sorry, in brain, blood, and liver. The other thing you'll notice is that the PRC2 associated one, this blue one, tends to have really strong age correlation, so much stronger even than the other two. And actually, what we find is it's almost consistent with the entire clock score in terms of the age cor correlations. Um, so the other thing we looked at is uh, aging in culture. So this idea that you could replicatively uh, passage cells and actually see the epigenetic clock go up. So we asked within these individual cell uh, modules what's happening. So this is in astrocytes. And what we find is the blue one, again, goes up fairly linearly as a function of passaging, whereas the green one, and especially this green-yellow one, goes up and then comes back down again. And this kind of inflection point tends to coincide with when we start seeing increases uh, in senescence in our population in terms of slowing of the doubling rate and also um, increases in beta gal. And again, I'll remove my uh, animation. Uh, we also looked at embryonic stem cells passaging. Interestingly, these first two actually seem to get, quote, younger as embryonic stem cells passage, <clears throat> whereas the blue one does show again to increase uh, epigenetic age as embryonic stem cells passage. And then finally, we also had uh, age turned immortalized cells, where again, you see this very nice, clean increase in the blue, but some kind of perhaps selection that might be happening in the other two uh, modules. We then also looked at uh, blood cell subsets because a lot of the epigenetic clocks, particularly for intervention trials, are going to be assessed in whole blood. So it's important to understand how different blood uh, cell types might actually uh, be reflected in the epigenetic clock. And the way to read this is kind of the difference in epigenetic age in years between these different cell types. Um, and what you can see is in this green yellow one, you get much younger epigenetic ages for these naive B and T cells, whereas you get much older epigenetic ages for granulocytes. Um, and in the blue one, it seems to be much older in things like memory B cells, which again might fit into this idea of replication driving these changes, <clears throat> given that uh, memory B cells have much faster turnover rates. That being said, even though 
they show differences in these different cell types, we still see very high age correlations when we're looking at sorted cells um, in terms of the epigenetic pattern. So it's not just capturing a change in cell composition, but it's probably also capturing within cell type changes as well. And then finally, if, if you were to do an intervention and you see an effect on one module, you would actually want to know, is that a module that has some implications for health downstream? So then what we did is we looked at um, the effect or the association between these different modules and risk of mortality over about a 20 year span. Um, this is showing all of the modules that we had, but I highlighted the three that I've been talking about. Um, and what you can see is this green yellow one seems to be highly associated with mortality risk. This is when we look at it in the PhenoAge um, clock and the GrimAge clock, which are the two kind of most mortality associated ones. Um, and I also did this both kind of without adjustment for cell composition, which is this one, and with adjustment, showing that it's not purely confounded by cell composition changes. Interestingly, this blue one, which again is this kind of replication-based one, doesn't in blood seem to show any association with um, remaining life expectancy or mortality risk. But that doesn't mean that it's functionally not important. And actually, we had a similar project that was going on in parallel where these same types of CPGs came up and showed some um, implications for risk of cancer when you're measuring it in that actual tissue. Um, so I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, really quickly go through that. Um, so basically this is work done by my former student, Chris Mintier, where their idea was to actually train an epigenetic clock that was specifically capturing something about uh, mitotic history or replication. So to do this, we actually use uh, these HTERT immortalized cells because we actually wanted something that was for the most part senescent independent and track something that was not gonna be slowing down. So Chris uh, trained an epigenetic clock using HTERT immortalized cells where he trained um, it to predict uh, population doubling. Uh, this is our training sample, our validation sample. It works really well. Um, and then we applied these to different contexts. So we looked at uh, just non-immortalized astrocytes, uh, primary astrocytes in culture, dermal fibroblast in culture, mammary fibroblast in culture, and then uh, different in vivo samples. So liver, uh, brain during this development, adult brain, and skin. And again, you see this very consistent increase in this, what we're calling cell drift or replication-based epigenetic clock. And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, these were implicated in these PRC2 uh, regions. So these are similar to what the, the blue module was picking up. Um, and these seem to be very important, what we found for cancer. So we looked at the difference between, these are different types of solid tumors. So the actual tumor versus non-tumor in that tissue, and we find an increase in epigenetic age uh, for the tumor. We also looked at if you were to test the epigenetic clock in the tumor, if it was predictive of survival. And we find, although this is a very sam small sample size that needs to be replicated, we find some evidence that it's predictive of survival. And perhaps uh, the more interesting thing was we looked at breast cancer, and but we looked at the normal tissue. So women with breast cancer in their normal tissue did they show an increase in epigenetic age relative to women's without breast cancer in their normal breast tissue? And we find some indication that there is an increase, which we think might suggest that there might be some epigenetic age remodeling that could precede or even sensitize tissue to tumor genesis. Again, we need to prove this out, but that's where the evidence seems to point. And then the last thing we kind of looked at here was this idea. Uh, so. A few years ago, uh, Vogelstein's Tomasetti published his paper saying that there's this bad luck hypothesis that the risk of cancer is just a roll of the dice uh, based on replication. So there's just a chance that you're going to um, get some driver mu mutation with every time the cell divides. Um, and they showed this picture where they showed lifetime risk of cancer in different tissue types uh, plotted against total stem cell divisions 
We looked at this in the context not of mutations, but actually epigenetic changes, where we looked at um, risk according to the SEER incidence rates across different tissue types plotted against our epigenetic uh, measure. And this is in normal tissue, non-cancer. And again, you find that, that uh, tissue types that are more prone to cancer tend to be higher in this cell drift. These are from the same individuals. So there's not a difference um, in terms of chronological age. We also show that this tracks with uh, the predicted um, turnover rate of these cells. And then finally, again, just to retouch on the reprogramming thing, this replication-based uh, epigenetic clock does seem responsive to OSKM reprogramming, where you get mostly during the maturation phase, so this is the de-differentiation phase of reprogramming, a rapid decline in the epigenetic clock. Um, and then we noticed this slight uptick, so we actually looked at more longer-term passaging of embryonic stem cells, again, in iPSCs. And we do see that even though it reaches this kind of bottom point, as you start passaging these cells again, it, it starts ticking up again. Uh, so in conclusion, epigenetic clocks do meet some criteria for good biomarkers of aging. They have some construct validity in terms of being able to predict things other than age, like morbidity and mortality. And um, we think that different statistical applications like the PC clock method that we showed to prove reliability can actually help them be better biomarkers down the road. Um, at the same time, they're not a singular phenomenon. So when you look at a change in the epigenetic clock, you need to actually think what that means and why you got that change. Um, so even though reprogramming seems to reset the overall epigenetic clock, that really came down to just three types of CPGs that were in the clock. So these PRC2 bivalent associated ones, which are blue, that show an increase in methylation with age. We think that they're replication driven and they show very strong, some of the strongest age correlations across tissues. But when measured in blood, they have weak mortality prediction, um, but perhaps are implicated in tumorigenesis. Uh, then these kind of green yellow ones, which we're thinking are probably associated with intergenic putative enhancers, they start hypermethylated, but lose methylation with age. There's maybe selection or some interesting kind of switching that goes on with senescence. So they, the epigenetic age increases up until senescence when you start seeing this kind of reversal. Uh, they seem to be associated with T-cell differentiation and their strong mortality signal, but this is even independent of the cell composition. And then these nucleosome occupied promoters, which are the green, also are hypomethylated or become hypomethylated with age. They're somewhat heterogeneous in iPSCs where they were at that kind of 50% and they have some mortality association. Uh, so with that, I wanna thank my lab at Altos, um, also Dr. Higgins Chen, which was who kind of led the PC clock development, uh, Chris Mintier, who worked on the replication driven um, PRC2 and the other collaborators for that project and happy to take any questions. Great talk, Morgan, fantastic. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of questions coming through. Um, I'll start if, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, I was interested in the, the technical there, the, so the, 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 what you described as noise. I mean, presumably that's, technical variation between between measurements and you, you you addressed it through this this principal component method which I don't think I really understood but but if it's is it, I wonder if it's technical then surely is, is there a way just to 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 address it by figuring out you know whereabouts in the measurement the technical variation is is coming from and just eliminating it technically with yeah, so that's a great question. That was actually our first approach when we tried to deal with this was that maybe there are just a few CPGs that are just prone to noise in the clocks. Um, and what we actually found was each sample, the technical noise is coming from a different CPG. And there are some that are a little more prone, but throwing them out actually made the clocks worse in terms of their prediction of aging outcomes. So those CPGs are still really important. So what we did is the map kind of the statistical way is you're almost averaging across CBGs that have the same uh, signal, you're kind of averaging 
the signal from them with the idea that technical noise in one will actually not have a big overall right. effect on the clock versus just you know taking a kind of one CPG as representing that whole signal, which then is prone to noise because it's kind of you're focusing all the signal on just this one variable. I see. But is the technical var is the te is the noise then is it actually coming from the this is the Illumina arrays that you're, that you're, you're yeah, using. Some, yeah, something I, we're not sure exactly which kind of step the technical noise kind of creeps in, but it's the amount of noise is fairly consistent across the different CVGs on the array. And then the ones that just have smaller kind of uh, ranges tend to be more prone to that because that absolute amount is okay, I see. bigger compared okay. to their standard deviation. Right. Um, so, so Laurie Boyer asks, um, says, 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 great talk. I mean, have you compared your data with with single cell transcriptomics, and and in particular, you know, looking at the different kind of categories of clock that you've you've deconvoluted, is there any relationship between the different types of clock and and changes in gene expression within those within those groups? Yeah, so we do have single cell RNA seq data for the serially passive cells that we're analyzing now, um, but we're also collecting a bunch of other kind of multiomic data to try and kind of layer this on. A lot of it will be bulk, some of it will be single cell. Um, one issue is that I think Vadim talked a little bit about this is that single cell methylation is still in its infancy. So actually understanding how much of these changes are coming from population shifts versus changes within cells is still not clear. Right, right. Yeah, and talking of Vadim, uh, Valentin Krakan mentions uh, Vadim in, in the context of, of metabolic clocks. So uh, Valentin, you know, wants to know, well, first of all, you know, is it possible to develop a, a metabolic clock? I, I think there is some evidence for, for such a thing, but so I guess more generally, What's your thoughts on the, the pros and cons of different types of potential clock, metabolic clock, transcriptomic clocks? I think now there's even a there's even a brainwave clock that the whereby you can measure people's brain waves in their sleep. And that that can also be used to measure chronological age. So so what do you know about the, the pros and cons of different types of clock? Yeah, I mean, there are so many clocks coming out, and I think that just shows so many things change with age. So you can, you can almost take anything and develop an aging clock out of it because there's hardly anything that stays kind of invariant to age. Um, and I think what we'll find as we develop more and more of these is they're probably capturing different signals. They'll have some overlapping signal and that might be where kind of the meat is where you want uh, to kind of measure aging, but they'll also have distinct features that each one can individually capture. Um, the one thing that made me so fascinating about methylation clocks versus other things is their universality. So you can use the same clock across different tissue types. You can use the same clock in vitro and now it's decorvest showing across mammals, um, which I don't think has really been shown for any other type of clock, but we might find that down the road for other ones as, they, as they're explored a little bit more. Right. And I know you're, you're doing quite a lot um, to try and extract, I think, from blood but use measurements in blood to measure the biological age of, of different tissues and, and kind of organ systems. So, so I wonder whether you think that, you know, different types of clock, I mean, maybe a brainwave clock might be particularly good at measuring neurodegeneration, for, for example. Do you, do you think that's likely? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the problem is we talk about biological age, like everyone has one biological age similar to one chronological age, but really all our body parts, even all our cells are aging at different rates. And you might want a different clock depending on what organ or tissue uh, you're profiling. We are developing this system age clock, which uses blood to try and capture the different yeah. organs because you're not going to take biopsies of right Ab absolutely yeah so I, I think yeah i i totally agree I, I think that you know different even within the same person different tissues probably have different biological ages but yeah so if, if we can if if, if, it, if if we can measure those you know those different tissues in blood that's obviously a very attractive thing to do um Zizhen has a uh Zizhen Do has a question 
Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so I have a question about the commercialization of the epigenetic clocks because apparently there are there are many companies working on it, and I also became very interested in knowing uh, my own epigenetic age. Uh, well, one thing is that I I see it's not cheap, uh, but the other thing is that I I guess my bigger question is that say if the clock tells me I'm 20 years or I'm uh, 80 years old, right? So how what exactly can I learn from this? So, uh, so the question is, can you comment on how the epigenetic clock, the age, is going to benefit uh, the the health of the general public, the healthy individuals? And a related question is, can you comment on where we are and what do you think is the future of promises for this industry? Yeah, I think those are kind of two related things. I think we're still very, very early. So I would caution anyone who's going to put too much faith on their measure they get back. You can do it for fun. And I think, you know, you should do it. And if you're going to think to actually evaluate that, you should do it in the context of lots of other things too. You know, get a normal blood panel or physical done. And, you know, if everything agrees that you're doing pretty well or not doing well, then I think maybe trust it. But I would never just trust the clock score you get back by itself, you know, independent of everything else. The other thing to keep in mind is, every company is gonna give you a different age. So how do you interpret that? Um, because they all use completely different clocks and different reference populations to get that age. Um, more than the actual age you get back, I think, again, assuming they're cap reducing this technical noise is kind of your change over time. So I would be more interested in from year to year, whether I was increasing a whole year or less than a year. But like you said, they're really expensive at this point. So you know, it's not something that I'm going to suggest everyone go out and spend $500 to get their epigenetic age measured every year. Um, I do think they have a lot of promise. So, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're not ready yet, but I do think the field can keep moving as we understand them a bit better and understand their applications and their, you know, the caveats. I think they will have a lot of promise, probably in more of the medical context than I mean, the direct to consumer, who knows? But yeah, I think there's still a lot we can learn. Thank you. Okay, so two or three more questions for Morgan and then we'll, we'll transition into, into the round table stage. So uh, Gary has a question. Thanks, Peter. Um, so Morgan, I, I actually have two questions. I may hold one for later, um, but you mentioned in one of your earlier slides that you were looking at cancer patients. I was wondering if you'd looked at patients that had undergone chemotherapy to see what that looks like over time, because you could see how you, that would have an application, right, in, in medicine and in health. Yeah, so I was part of um, a collaboration where they looked at radiation therapy, um, and they did see increases in epigenetic age in association with that. And I think there was reduction if they also did an exercise intervention. But I, I would imagine, again, that chemotherapy will show an increase in epigenetic age. And, but I, I haven't looked at that specifically in my work. Right, because I was, my, my, my thoughts were that then now you, you could take treatment measures to um, ameliorate the impacts of whatever type of chemotherapy that you would give to a, a particular patient. So, yeah. Thank you. Ognian? Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. I think I'll be thinking about and processing the information for the next week at least, if not more. Uh, if I can add uh, my very naive contribution to the uh, debate on the noise of the genetic clock and also follow up with uh, a question uh, about that. So my personal uh, thought and understanding is that this is uh, the problem of noise is a little bit intrinsic in the way that the clocks operate because they're in a way they're very fragile models they're very sensitive so they're linear uh, models so each locus is additively added to the uh, some total so and some of the quick so we multiply the percent uh, methylation by the coefficient and some of these coefficients sometimes are quite large so mm -hmm. even one mistaken or problematic locus for whatever reason can add several years uh, to the estimate. And of course, on average, these will cancel out, but they don't always cancel exactly. So 
Uh, from that point of view, also, I would expect, I don't know if that's the case, and please correct me if I say nonsense, I would expect that clocks that have more loci should have higher noise because if this is the problem, then the more loci we have and the higher the coefficients are, the larger the noise should be. I don't know if that's the case. Um, and from that point of view, I think uh, um, I find it really exciting, the development of the principal component clock because this is potentially a very good way to get rid of that noise because what principal components do really well is that they capture the main trend in your data and they ignore all the noise that you're not really interested in. Uh, so I uh, I want to ask you a bit more about how uh, how you calculate your clock because I have to admit I read both the preprint and the published paper and I still haven't <laughs> figured out exactly. So you have your data point which is based on the linear model. Then you calculate presumably principal components. You detect the first principal component, which would be the main trend, and you project on that principal component. Is that how it works? No, so you don't take the linear model for the clock at all. We ignore the original models for the clocks completely. You take your methylation data, so your matrix of you know CBGs by samples, uh, and then you calculate, you get all the principal components. So we put out um, all the loadings for them. So you you get your your PC matrix from that. Mm -hmm. Then each of the PCs that were selected have some weight associated, and you you multiply them by a weight and then add. But it's an entirely new equation. It's not. It actually mm -hmm. doesn't use the original clock equations at all. We went back to the initial data mm -hmm. and retrained them all. But yeah, the original weights are not not used. Okay. In the PC okay. so you start so you start from the matrix of um DNA methylation levels itself mm -hmm. and that's your, and get the, your, space. your okay. eigenvalue matrix and then right. the eigenvalues get multiplied by in by weights and then summed and and you we usually have about uh 500 you know a few hundred pcs end up contributing so it's not just pc1 that contributes to your mm -hmm. clock oh okay i see so uh if that's the case then what makes the PC Horvat clock be a Horvat clock and the PC Fino H clock a Fino H. Do you use the same data sets? Is that? Yeah, uh, for Fino H, we updated it because the original data set was a little bit small. So we combined it with a bigger one. Uh, the Horvath one, we didn't have access to all the samples that Steve originally trained on, but we tried to get surrogates and then show that we you know, weren't losing anything in terms of construct validity in the new one. OK, oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, there's there's more questions in the chat, Morgan, that perhaps you can you can get time to look at. Um, but I think we should move to the uh, the round table um, stage. And uh, I know a number of us have uh, we do have hard stops at uh, eleven o'clock Pacific time, which is just over fifteen minutes. So I think we will have to stop um, about eleven. Um, I have to stop there, and I know others do. So it would be great if the if all the panelists could uh, could stay on until until eleven o'clock, so then we can have a really interesting conversation, albeit um, perhaps a little bit brief. But so I've been you know jotting down a few um, kind of questions that have occurred to me, you know, based on common themes um, throughout the talks this morning, um, and. You know, one of them I thought I thought Payal's slide was interesting. I mean, that that figure that that you showed from your review with with Shelley, okay, which shows all the different manifestations of of chromatin aging. Okay, I mean, it occurred to me that you know we could almost call that the hallmarks of of chromatin aging. Okay, because there's there's lots of different dimensions to it, and then. You know, obviously, when we think about the hallmarks of aging, we often debate. So, which of the hallmarks are most important? Okay, is there a hierarchy? Is one, you know, is one driving the others? Are some of them drivers? Are some of them passengers, etc.? So, so I wonder if if we ask the same question about the hallmarks of of chromatin aging, okay, which which do we think, uh, you know, would be the most in, important? You, you highlighted a few of them. I think you know Morgan's kind of Mexican food analogy reminded me of the same thing. Okay, that there's obviously many different dimensions to it, and and Morgan is deconvoluting the different types of of CPG. So if we think of all the different types of change of of chromatin, 
DNA methylation, histone loss, H3K27. Do we have any consensus as to perhaps which might be the most important? And I, I guess by important, I mean, you know, which do we think, well, I guess they could be important in two ways, okay? Which, which, ones, are, which ones are the best biomarkers and which ones are, which ones are the drivers? Okay, because obviously the biomarkers are important, but the drivers are also important because we want to target them. So any any thoughts on on that from 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 people? I mean, I can I can uh, have a go at it. I mean, so, so so the question is, what is the most upstream event that we can, you know, um, at least uh, get from all this work? Yeah. Um, so K9 methylation going down seems to be, um, you know, a very uh, reproducible change. Uh, but lamin B1 reduction is also a reproducible change. Now the question is, what's the kinetics? So even though lamin B1 loss may be triggered first, does it go down at the same rate? as let's say K9 methylation. So a lot of it might depend on the half-lives of these proteins. Um, um, so, so the question is, uh, so, so, so I don't know the answer, but to me, I think the K9 loss and the lamin B1 loss seems to be the most upstream um, sort of feature of aging and senescence. Okay. Oh, does lamin B1 go down in physiological aging or is it, or what, I don't mean, or does lamin B1 only go down in senescence or does it go down also in an aged tissue, which is not senescent? I thought it was really mostly just associated with senescence. It is associated with senescence, but as I showed you, that was mined data from a published lamin B1 um, chip seek study from mouse liver. It does show a significant. True, group. true. Yeah, you showed that. Right. And uh, I think progeria like Hutchinson, Guilford, progeria patients also have loss of, you know, uh, basically lamina destruction. Now, that may not be lamin B1 per se, but uh, but some something to do with the breakdown of the lamina, whether triggered by lamin A, lamin B, lamin C, we don't know. But that seems to kind of start the whole process. But if you look at the level of lamin B1 drop versus K9 drop, I think the K9 loss is much more prominent. So again, I don't know the kinetics of it all. But also, Kira, I, I want to add to this discussion about the lamin. Um, so even in some of the tissues, you don't see the global loss of the protein. But when you do the chip seek, you also see the, the quantity and the quality of the labs becomes worse during aging. So in a way, I, I, I do agree with Pyle that the, the loss of the lamina and the heterochromatin is a driver of the epigenetic changes. I, I also want to add to the discussion, what is the upstream, downstream, and this hierarchy analysis of the yeah. uh, genome? Uh, so, uh, because you know, we, we work on the nuclear autophagy and how this process breaks down the nuclear proteins. Uh, say the, the, the lamin B1 and other epigenetic regulators. So what, what we think about the upstream signaling is number one is the DNA damage, for example, the, the ATM signaling. The other is related to stress. For example, uh, many of our substrate we think is triggered by P38, MAP kinase, and some other stress signal. So I, I think this is consistent with what Vera was suggesting, the, the DNA damage, you know, how 36 was recruited to the damaged side instead of doing its normal job. So from that discussion, I would argue that the DNA damage response and the stress signal are on the very top of the aging related epigenetic changes. Okay. I mean, no, so I, I would, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, I, I thought, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, what Zhuzhan said, because, well, if, you know, one of the definitions of aging, I think Vadim was talking about it would be, accumulation of damage. So if we think from this point of view, yes. Uh, now to Peter's original question, um, right, it, you know, maybe it's harder for me to talk about one specific mark, uh, but, you know, thinking about overall change, uh, loss of uh, heterochromatin on transposons, we, at least we know the functional outcome of that. It leads to inflammation. And I think H3K9 trimethyl 
is the mark that is quite rich on transposons, so that would go together with this. Okay. I guess I want to I want to speak up for and Morgan. I don't know. Morgan might agree with this. I want to speak up for though for um, you know H three K twenty seven trimethylation and, and DNA methylation. Okay, because I mean I think Morgan's um, talk highlighted the relationship between those two in, in I think in, in Morgan's blue clock. Pyle, you also mentioned this reciprocal relationship between methylation changes in H3K27, I think. And, and this actually echoes, you know, there's a there's a literature in the cancer field on this, okay, that the H3K27 trimethylation and, and, and DNA methylation are, are kind of antagonistically relate regulated okay and Richard Meehan has proposed I think that loss of methylation in cancer cells leads to a redistribution of H3K27 trimethylation so um I know I, I wonder whether the, the this kind of an important nexus you know between those two which is uh, you know I guess I don't know which one comes first is it changes in k27 or changes in dna methylation perhaps the relationship between those two is um is particularly important morgan do you want to say anything on that no i mean i, I agree i think and it's hard to say you know which is more important a loss of heterochromatin with aging or yeah these changes in kind of more of these euchromatin promoter regions and i i think you know it always comes to we need more data or more multi-omics in the same samples because i think you know you measure one in one sample type of sample and then another and another, or maybe maybe of just a few, but it's hard to really do a comparison and also understand kind of the temporality of these changes and are some kind of setting off others. And we I, I think we just need better kind of time force and kind of multi omics, which again just comes back to money and time. But I I'm agnostic on what is the most important. And actually it might be more of this kind of higher order global phenomenon that altogether these are kind right. of complex process. And I don't know if you will be able to pin it on just kind of one type of that. Right, right, right. The key. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, I have another quite slightly different topic then that I want to get people's thoughts on. And that's the relationship um, between uh, epigenetic drift and epigenetic clocks okay do do people see those as the same thing or 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 different okay i mean so my understanding has been that a, a clock is something which changes systematically and, and reproducibly and you know between individuals okay so we can actually use it to measure age whereas drift okay my, my understanding of drift is defined by Mario Fraga and Manella Stella, I think, through their original twins paper many years ago, is that that drift is epigenetic changes where where individuals actually become more different. Okay, so drift. My understanding has always been that. Oops, am I still here? Yeah, I lost you for a minute. My understanding has been always been that drift and clock, uh, drift and clocks are, are two two different things. Um, and, and, you know, so perhaps clocks are, are measuring primarily chronological age, but maybe it's the drift, which is perhaps more important in terms of the differences between individuals and the predisposition, the differences in disease between individuals. What, what do people think of clocks versus drift? Uh, I mean, I think actually a lot of the epigenetic clocks are measuring drift, even though I think clock is like a really problematic term that somehow I actually don't know who assigned. I think Steve didn't come up with the term, but you know, it, it's catchy, but they're they're not this kind of timekeeper. And actually probably because you, you see, you do see kind of this regression towards the mean and CPGs that tend to be yeah. hyper hypomethylate moving towards the mean overall, not not across the board. Um, and I do think in drift, you can also think of kind of a probability distribution, right? Some CPGs are going to be more prone to this drift, and that's why you might get something that you could build a clock out of, and because it, it's just capturing this kind of propensity or kind of uh, sensitivity to drift. Um, but again, I think 
not all the CPGs and clocks are drift, but I, I would say a lot of them probably are, especially the replication based. Okay. I mean, I wonder whether, you know, some of the clocks that you're developing now, which are more biological, are, 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 are the more biological clocks, I mean, are they measuring drift? Whereas the, you know, the, the, the true, the original, more chronological clocks are, well, you know, what I would call a, a clock. But as, as you as you move more into kind of measuring biological clocks as a as opposed to chronological clocks, clocks are you are you measuring something which is more akin to to, to drift? Yeah, I do think we are getting closer to that thing, and and what you do see is that the variance between people increases with age. So that's kind of yeah. that people do kind of drift apart. Yeah, and there are some CPGs like the E level two kind of uh, CPGs in the promoter that are very clock like, but I think most of them aren't necessarily. Yeah, the drift may not be entirely random. There is probably a big random component, but there may also be a non-random, like what Morgan mentioned, that some CPGs, maybe because of their location or the functional genes around them, would have um, certain you know, predisposition to drift in a certain direction. And that's probably what the functional part of the clock would be measuring. OK. So, so another question in the last few minutes. Um, I mean, you know, we're all thinking a lot now about epigenetic rejuvenation. It's, you know, it's it's a very exciting subject, and depending on who you who you listen to, I mean, this is something which is already doable, or perhaps you know something to aspire to. So, but I guess my question is, um, you know, as, as people who are thinking about this, what what would be, I mean, as a field. What's our definition of rejuvenation? Because I would argue that, you know, curing or reversing one specific pathology is not rejuvenation, okay? I mean, cancer is a disease of aging, but if you cure that person of cancer, we don't say we've rejuvenated that person. And in actual fact, the chemotherapy has probably aged that person. Okay, so so what, what would be, what would be our definition of, of rejuvenation that, we, you know, so that we can really define this, 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 re, you know, rejuvenation by, by reprogramming? Any thoughts on that? I don't think it has to be associated with the overall improvement of physiological function. Right, right. So, 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 you, so you think a, a minimum, a certain number of pathologies i mean can we put a number on it or a, or there are some specific features of aging that we would well, want well I, I wouldn't necessarily say pathologies because not all aging is disease True. related but in this frailty score like you measure running speed right? if we see that improves or the decline rate even slows down so we say that's kind of rejuvenation so okay. i would you know probably more focusing on overall physiological measures rather than uh specific disease biomarkers i i would think of it as like a multi-scale state shift right so you need to shift the state at the molecular level to something akin that looks more youthful but that should also be seen at a functional level kind of like Vera was saying, or Peter, what you were saying in terms of pathologies, where you're seeing also at the organ and organismal level, a shift in the state where you have manifestations of health that are also more useful. It has to translate across kind of the biological scales, I think. Right. And presumably, so one component of this might be improved cognitive function, but, but we want to rejuvenate the brain without erasing memories, presumably. So... Um, this is deep, Peter. This is deep. But, but I do think that we do have very good data on longitudinal changes across multiple physiological systems. So that would be a reasonable barometer to start with. Right. <laughs> this is going to keep me up at night. This is a good, uh, a good question. Um, if we're programming can do what exercise can do, then we're, we're part way there. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good analogy. Yeah, because I, I guess, yeah, we, we know that exercise has benefits in in terms of I don't know, you know certainly certainly has physiological benefits so I, I guess I guess maybe that's 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 something to 
maybe that's something to measure rejuvenation strategies by. Can it can it somehow phenocopy the the benefits of of exercise? Well, but maybe you know, population like definition would be reduction in the chance of death, right? That's <laughs> ultimately would be a measure. Yeah. I, I want to I want to add to this discussion about this epigenetic rejuvenation by by saying that although it sounds like a very big gigantic topic, a lot of times if we are able to target one single specific pathway, and uh, what we see is the global rejuvenation of the whole thing. For example, uh, this all the aging hallmarks, right? So if you are able to target mitochondria, a lot of times you see a lot of other hallmarks are also improving. So. Although this is a very ambitious, sounds very big, uh, I do think if we are able to target specific pathways, for example, the last, for example, the 36, and a lot of times we see the global rejuvenation of the epigenome. So that's why I think this is what's amazing about the aging research. Although we are all coming from different directions, different perspectives, and then it's all gonna talk together and then we are gonna rejuvenate the whole thing. So, yeah, so maybe we can, Leave it on that note, uh, Doe, that um, your, your comment about amazing aging research, I think we all agree with, with that. I think we all have a shared passion for, for that. Um, so, uh, Gar I, I, as I say, I don't want to run over. I know people have hard stops. Gary and, and Mason, do you, um, do you have anything that you want to say to close? Yes, yes, please. Um, I think, first of all, it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge the passing of yeah. David Alice, well who said. was a pioneer in the field of epigenetics and a mentor to a great number of people. Yeah, thank you. So I, I thought we should just close with um, this image of David. I know David was um, very influential to Active Motif when we were young and um, had, a, had a, a, a great positive impact both uh, um, um, directly um, when we were uh, acquiring a, an antibody company and um, also just with the work that he did and the, um, the targets that he provided us with for generating antibodies. Um, so I'd like to finish with that. And I just want to thank everyone for their participation over the last three days. I'd like to thank the speakers for some excellent talks and for the great discussions. I, in, in particular, this, this today's discussion, I wish could have gone on for a lot, a lot longer. Um, and I just hope everyone learned something. I, I know I learned a lot. Um, and I look forward to doing this again. Um, we'll have another event next year. Um, we'll try and keep it fresh and exciting. And um, uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone and uh, see you next year. Yeah, and th thanks very much, Gary and Mason, for hosting the whole thing and totally echo what you've said about David. I, I guess going back to what we're just saying, you know, which of these which of these hallmarks is is most important, if that's a reasonable question. With You know, without David Alice, we wouldn't know about many of these things. So thanks very much. Okay, and thank you, Peter, um, for being um, such a help in the organising of this and the running of it. So Pleasure. thank you. Thanks, Thanks to all the speakers. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.